You're quick, you youngins are quick learners there. Okay. Uh, good evening, good evening, everyone. Today is Wednesday, April 6th. This is a workshop of the Scarborough Town Council. I'll call this meeting to order and note that uh, we have four councilors present. Councilor Katarina will be joining us a little bit late and Councilor Johnson will not be able to make it this evening. Um, we're, we're together to talk about a proposed ordinance for electric vehicle charging that's um, kind of circled the wagons. It's coming out of the sustainability committee. It's gone through ordinance, uh, the council level ordinance. And, uh, you know, we don't have a lot of opportunity as a council to meet with members of our, some of our committees. So uh, assuming we get through some of the details and, and what you guys need from us out of the, uh, the EV ordinance, I'd certainly be interested in hearing what else you have on your plate and what, where your interests are, lie these days. Um, so I don't know all of you. Maybe it makes sense to start with some introductions. Uh, why don't we start here? Okay. Angela. <laughs> I am Angela Blanchett, the town engineer. Uh, I'm Ernie Milner, uh, resident and uh, member of the Sustainability Committee. Thank you. Deb McDonough, same. <laughs> Anson Boder, and I'm a member of the committee as well. David Kirstein, also a member of the committee. Rick Monking, also a member of the committee. And chair. And chair. And chair. Yeah. And chair. All right. <laughs> I, it's it's, 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 it's everything done team work. Work. And Rick and brought his computer. Team work, so. Rick, Rick, you can't <laughs> duck it like that. You just <laughs> got to admit it. I'm Jay Chase. I'm the planning director. Jamie Fitch, sustainability coordinator. Why don't we keep going, April? Oh, sure. April Sider, town council. John Anderson, town council. John Clutchin. April, you're our uh, liaison to this committee as I well. I sure right? am. Excellent. Tom Hall, town manager. Don Hamill, town council. Okay, with that, uh, my part's done. <laughs> um, I believe Jamie's going to drive. I am, yeah. Okay, take it away. All right, uh, well, Rick is going to um, do the kind of first introduction. Um, so if you want to get that going. Yeah, um, first of all, thank you for, for having us today. Um, it was it was easier than I thought to get on the agenda at the town council. It was just a matter of emailing you, John, which was really nice. And, and it's really, um, we're thankful that we could get in front of you sooner, knowing that it's the budget season and uh, your hands are, are going to be full soon. Uh, but really this comes out of some work that we've been doing since June of, of this past year where after the town's uh, comprehensive plan was, was approved by you folks, and we had already just maybe a year uh, before then uh, updated our comprehensive energy plan, all of these things seem to kind of hit, you know, um, a trifecta, if you will. Uh, we're able to take a look at some of the ordinances that we have in the town, some of uh, what goes on and look at it, how it compares with our new comprehensive plan. And the committee thought that, um, you know, bringing in the, the idea of electric vehicles is certainly uh, not only a state, a national goal, a state goal, but also we felt like we need to get ahead of the curve here a little bit and see what we can do to, uh, to promote this transformation that's going to happen, whether we want it to or not. Uh, the way the car manufacturers are talking, uh, EVs are coming and they're coming faster than what we have infrastructure for. So this is what kind of got us our juices going and trying to speed up the process of you know, positioning Scarborough uh, to a place where our citizens have a way to uh, bring this new technology to A, their driveway or their garages, and B, what happens if they're in a situation with an EV and they need charging and the infrastructure isn't in place? Well, they're not going to buy a car, right? They're going to keep that gasoline engine. And so we really wanted to uh, uh, bring this out earlier. We're missing opportunities the longer we put this off. And we feel like now is the best time to to begin the conversation, we've really done a lot of research and a lot of uh, looking into this, had stakeholder, Jamie's gonna describe some of the other things that we've done behind the scenes to get this in a point where we can talk to you folks about. And so I think I'm gonna turn it over to Jamie at this point and kind of give you a big picture of what this is, what some of the terms mean, 
because a lot of this may be new to you folks and we don't want to scare you uh, with, with a lot of things, uh, a lot of acronyms or things like that. But we certainly will provide any sort of information you need uh, to help you make decisions as you're going forward and looking at this ordinance. We understand it's gonna go back to the ordinance committee to be worked and we, there's opportunities for the public uh, to, to weigh in here. So we know this isn't an overnight uh, experience, uh, but we don't want it to be a multi-year experience that, that we all wanna share in. So with that, Jamie, can I turn it over to you and uh, let you take off? Sure. So I'm just going to give a little bit more information about um, where things are heading in terms of EV charging and um, electric vehicle adoption um, and some of the high level recommendations that the committee has um, so that you all just to give you all um, a little bit more information and hopefully have an opportunity for you to have qu ask questions and we can have a discussion about this. So as Rich, Rick touched on, um, why are we talking about EV charging infrastructure? Um, it's a priority on many levels, local, state, and national. Um, our comprehensive plan calls for the town to increase energy conservation and efficiency. And our comprehensive energy and sustainability plan um, calls for us to reduce vehicle emissions where possible through diverse measures. And when this was put together um, several years ago, EVs weren't on the forefront, but they're becoming more and more um, common. And we'll talk about why. Um, the Maine Won't Wait 2020 Climate Action Plan calls for um, an increase to 41,000 light duty EVs over the next three years. Um, that is about an order of magnitude away um, from where we currently are. Um, but uh, there are um, steps in place and, and plans in place to get us there. Um, and increasing even further to over 200,000 EVs um, by 2030. So these are pretty lofty goals. And um, the infrastructure bill that was passed last year um, allocates $7.5 billion for EV charging infrastructure with the goal of having 500,000 EV charging stations um, around the country by 2030. Um, and obviously there's funding to help make that happen through that bill. Um, and as Rick mentioned, uh, EVs are, are becoming more common. So um, experts are expecting price parity with gas powered vehicles over the next couple of years. Um, and the number of EVs available on the market are expected to triple by 2025 and car companies are pledging to go all electric there um, on the screen is the uh, a listing of legacy car companies and their projected dates to fully transform their fleets from um, internal combustion to in hybrid to EV, fully EV. Um, so it's coming and especially with gas prices the way they are now, um, EVs are becoming even more popular um, more quickly. And it's actually right now, I, from reports that I've read, car companies are having trouble meeting current demand because of gas prices. <laughs> Another big reason is to avoid retrofit costs. So people are buying EVs now, they're going to need places to charge them. And if we're planning for it during development, we're going to save a whole lot of money um, in the range of um, two to $4,000 per parking space if we're planning to do it um, during development as opposed to going back and retrofitting parking lots to put in EV chargers. Um, and this is based on a, a study that was done in 2019 in California. And so we just want to talk a little bit about some of the definitions that we use, um, that we'll use tonight and that we used in the um, draft ordinance um, that was provided to you. So um, this all says EVCS, which stands for electric vehicle charging station. I'm just going to say EV because EVCS is a mouthful. So EV capable basically means the parking lot was constructed with conduit so that um, the uh, electricity could be easily run to the, um, the spaces in the future um, when uh, charging stations need to be installed. EV ready means that the conduit is stall, installed and the electric, electrical capacity is there and essentially um, the charging station can be, it can be a plug and play, pretty easy to, uh, to um, install at that point. And then EV installed is, um, means that the conduit's there, the electricity is there and the charger is in place and um, cars are able to charge at that location. Um, there are 
three types of chargers. We don't really talk much about level one chargers. Those are just a standard charger that come with electric vehicles that plug into a regular um, outlet at your house. They don't charge very quickly or efficiently. Um, and so that's why we are focusing on um, level two and three charging through this. A level two charger is what we have here um, behind town hall. Um, it requires a, a 240 volt circuit similar to a clothes dryer. Um, and you can charge um, 18 to 28 miles of EV range per hour. Um, and then level three chargers are also called DC fast chargers. These um, charges are that you have seen probably in like the Walmart parking lot or some of the um, rest stops on the turnpike. And you can get three to 20 miles of EV range per minute of charging. Um, much higher electrical capacity needed to um, accommodate these chargers. Um, and there are companies that um, will provide that um, enter into agreements with um, lot owners to, um, to basically install these chargers for free or low cost um, and they can charge for the electricity that, um, that these chargers provide. So they are able to recoup some of their, or recoup their costs over time. Um, all right, so I just wanna talk briefly about um, where the committee is thinking in terms of um, the recommended requirements. Um, we are looking at both um, residential and commercial um, development as part of this ordinance. Um, most EV owners are charging at home. So there is a, a paradigm shift between what we're used to when we need to top off our tank, we drive to a gas station, we fill up in a matter of minutes and drive away. It's not so much like that with EVs. Um, it takes a little longer and so in, in most cases. Um, so most people with an EV try to charge at home um, overnight, um, plug it in when they get home, wake up in the morning, their, um, their battery's topped off. Um, and so because of the prevalence of um, residential charging, we um, are recommending or the committee is recommending that all um, single and two family dwellings, um, new construction that's built are um, EV ready, <coughs> which essentially can be as easy as putting a, a 240 outlet in a garage. Um, so that uh, someone, if an EV owner, um, or if a person buys that house, has an EV, they can buy an EV charger that can plug right into that outlet. Um, we've heard from the development community that it gets a little bit trickier with multifamily dwellings. So we did have a stakeholder meeting back in December with a number of um, developers who um, are actively developing in Scarborough to get um, their impressions and feedback on this. Um, and I will say that the committee did um, scale back their recommendations based on the feedback that, that we heard at that stakeholder meeting. Um, so the, the committee um, is recommending all indoor or covered parking in multifamily dwellings be EV ready. So again, having a 240 um, volt outlet at each of those um, indoor parking spaces and then outdoor surface parking, um, it would be a combination of EV installed, EV ready and EV capable spaces so that at some point in the future, 100% of the parking lot could be um, built out with electric vehicle chargers. And then moving on to um, public or commercial lots. So um, looking in turn, thinking about where people are going and spending time. Um, so again, we are looking at a paradigm shift for how we top off our, our vehicles when we are talking about EVs. So thinking about where people are spending their time, um, they're probably spending their time in larger retail um, locations and at health clubs. It can be, you know, upwards of um, half hour to an hour or more, depending on what they're doing. So um, looking again at a combination of EV installed, ready and capable spaces so that in the future that parking, 25% of all of the parking spaces in those developments could be um, built out with EV chargers. And then small retail sales and service, we're still looking at a future build out of 25% of the parking spaces, but they won't have any um, requirements to install chargers initially, just have um, a portion of their spaces be EV ready and EV capable. And um, lodging establishments, and actually that percentage is wrong on there. We were actually um, looking at 100% of parking spaces at lodging establishments, thinking that people are coming from afar, um, in the future there, uh, it could be very plausible that everybody is driving an electric vehicle 
Um, and if they're, um, the hotel is filled to capacity, um, they may need all of their spaces um, to have EV chargers um, installed and available. So sorry about that error on there. And then um, the committee did um, discuss in lieu fees, there was some, um, we're really looking for some information or feedback um, from the council on this point, um, because there was um, very strong opinions at the ordinance committee um, where basically um, the, the message was either the town is going to require this or they're not. Um, and they don't necessarily, we don't necessarily want um, to give people a way out because oftentimes we don't do anything with our in lieu fees that are collected. So um, if the, the town is, um, is uh, very supportive of EV charging, um, then we should just um, have our developers do this um, and, set, and not give them an opportunity to opt out to an in fee. Um, but I left it up there as a point of discussion. So um, in these fees, um, are kind of in line with what it would cost to install um, um, this type of uh, infrastructure based on, and it's based on what the requirements would be within the ordinance. So um, $15,000 per level three um, parking space. A level, if a parking space is required to have a level three charger, if they opt out, it would be $15,000 per space to opt out. Level two, $8,000 per space to opt out. Um, EV ready. So again, that is um, providing electricity and conduit. Um, that would be $3,000 per parking space. And EV capable parking spaces would, would be $1,000 per space to opt out. And the committee's thought was that um, any revenue generated from in lieu fees could be used to install EV chargers in public parking areas um, in town. So that is my very quick overview of of the committee's thinking and happy to um, have discussion and answer questions. And I'm sure the committee, oh, and Deb has a question. No, I just <laughs> wanted to jump in and say, um, we started driving an electric car in 2013. Um, and of course this was a existing home that nobody was thinking about electric uh, cars at that point. It cost more for the electricians to drill holes in the concrete wall between the electrical panel and the garage and to run conduit up and over than it did to buy the charger. Um, for the first three months, we just used the 110, which is again, super slow um, because it wasn't clear to us if that would be like a normal thing or not. And so the upfront cost of putting these into the house, what surprises me is that they're not doing that already, but they're not hearing from customers that they want it. But if you don't already have a car, you're not going to say that you want that. And we're sort of in a trap. It's parallel to what happened to us in probably 2001 when we had a contractor put an addition onto uh, or build into our attic and they used foam batting insulation. And two years later, we had all that ripped out because we didn't know any better. It was up to code but it wasn't what we were gonna need moving forward. And so each of these are just for new construction. They were not like requiring somebody to go back and retrofit all the existing anything, but it just seems really silly to be building a house today that doesn't have a wire going to the garage that's capable of charging a car. It seems really silly to be building a parking lot today that doesn't have electrical access I was on the committee at UNE that was trying to figure out where to put some chargers on campus down in Biddeford. And we were really constrained by where we could get power. And it's kind of a silly place to put the spots, but that's where we could get power. And so we just need to get out ahead of this and make sure that before anybody puts down however many inches of blacktop that is, that they've got the conduit underneath. Before anybody puts a concrete wall in a house, they've got the conduit moving through. So we're not asking people to go back and do that later and having that be a barrier uh, for adoption. I'd like to follow up on Deb's point. Uh, she talked about the, uh, how <clears throat> it's common sense to uh, put the electrical in ahead of time or during construction and the increased costs of, of doing it after the fact. Uh, but that's in the case of a single family ho home where she owns the house. Uh, you know, in, in the future, the people who will be really disadvantaged are people who live in condos and apartments who don't have the uh, ownership of the land or the property 
to make those kinds of changes. So I think it's a, those are that's a constituent that's really in need of this ordinance. Yeah, and I think we're a little bit behind on that. Uh, you look at all the, the multifamily buildings that are being built today and that are projected to be coming online over the next few years. Uh, there, there is this real concern that um, you know, there's no avenue for them to charge. So what will they do if they really want an EV? They're going to have to charge at, a, at where they work. So this was is what led us into this going to commercial buildings and figuring out, you know, what would be a, an appropriate mix of parking spots that would have uh, capabilities to charge uh, for the employees that live in an apartment, brand new apartment, but have no way of charging. And um, that's primarily a driver for getting this into other uh, building types, such as small retail and large retail and healthcare and uh, uh, the lodging industry. We should have some at the high school where, where we were likely to have uh, more teachers using it. Now, again, everybody, the studies show that people charge at home and they charge when they get home at night and through the night and then they have in most cases, if they're under a level two, they'll have a full tank. If they're on a level one, which comes with the car and they have depleted their battery, they may not even be able to drive out on a full tank. That's how slow the level ones are. Um, and, and it really is um, critical to, to provide this infrastructure. But the one key barrier that we hear a lot of is who pays for that electricity? Uh, if you're at a multifamily building and you have, um, you know, a parking spot that's assigned to you and it has an EV charger, uh, you might have it in your lease where you pay an extra $20 a month. It's interesting. Uh, does anybody really know, know what it costs right now with the gas price we have today compared to what it would cost an EV to charge? Anybody have a guess? What is today's average price of, of, elect, of uh, gas is somewhere in the neighborhood of 431. Just, I think that's what the governor's energy office has. To charge a vehicle uh, with electrified gas, it's $1.59 per gallon equivalent. So there is a real motivation out there for uh, and a real appetite for this technology. And it's only gonna get crazier as, as time goes on. And so it, it's been this market about who pays for the electricity. And, you know, we've never ever been able to do things right. Look at our cell phones. We have an Apple phone and then we have Android type phones. They all take a different charger. Uh, and, and so EV chargers are no different. We screwed that up from the beginning. So a Tesla needs a certain jack, and then all the other vehicles can use this other jack. And then if you pay the extra money to Tesla, you can get an adapter so you can use anything. Um, but it, it just goes to show that while this is still new, there's been lots of advancements over the last couple of years. How do you pay for the electricity? Well, again, there's an Apple phone and an Android phone. There's these, you may have heard the, the term charge point. It's one of these nationally recognized charging entities that are, are plug and play. You get their charger, it comes smart. It has all the SIM, it has the SIM card in it and it can do the billing for you and it provides you lots of bells and whistles. And that's more like the Apple. And then they have this other one called the OCPP, which is the um, I got to get it, the open charge uh, port, portacle, uh, uh, protocol, that's what it is. I'm, I'm learning this too, and, and it's been really crazy. That's why I have my notes. This is more like the Android. You can have lots of bells and whistles, but you pay for it. Uh, it it's compatible with other operating systems, and uh, you can use fobs, and you can use uh, cards. You're all aware now that you can go downtown and you pay for your port, uh, parking with a debit card and you get a receipt and you put it on the windshield. 
some of this kind of stuff is in play today. And so that's how building owners can, can offer the ability to charge vehicles, but recoup some of the funds too. Deb? And there's nothing in the ordinance that describes how people need to do that funding. Some businesses might choose to offer that as a perk for their customers. Others might charge for it. Others might charge a flat fee for having access to the charger. There's a lot of different ways that people are doing that. And that then would be in the hands of whomever is, is installing these things. So. But yes, there are automated plug and play ways to do it that you contract. We need one of these over here. Please do that. Don't talk to me about it. Uh, down to ones that would be electricity paid for by the site. Can I ask a clarification question about the ordinance? Because you guys have talked about how this would apply to new, but like for, for redevelopment, like what just happened at the Rosemont across the way with the public safety building, is there a trigger that says, under certain circumstances of redevelopment that this ordinance would apply? Yeah, the intent was that it would apply to redevelopment as well. That's something that we need to work with our planners on to know mm -hmm. what that trigger would be. But okay. the thought was that um, that it would apply to redevelopment, depend like if, if they were doing site work, if they were reconfiguring any parking, anything like that, it would apply. Okay, yeah, I think that would be interesting to better understand and explore because I, I hear all the benefits of new development and I 100% agree that this just makes sense. But if we're gonna be doing redevelopment as well, what what are the triggers that, that indicate that that redevelopment, this ordinance would apply that needs to happen in order for, for this to work or be clear when they're, when whoever's buying that land, that they know that that comes with that additional cost likely to them to, to do that work. Can we ask more questions? No, okay. <laughs> that's why we're here. Okay. Um, and some of this is just more, more like as a consumer, just out of interest that you guys probably might be more aware of than I am. But like similar to how when you buy heat pumps and you get that that tax credit, payback, yeah, that tax credit, is it the same thing if people do that in their homes if they want to retrofit a home? Is there a current tax credit to the state? I don't believe that falls under the energy efficiency tax credit that like if you put in a heat pump water heater in or a, a, a heat pump in, I don't think that covers the uh, electric vehicle. I'm, I, but don't quote me on that. I'll go back and I'll research that. But last time I looked, I don't think that is a uh, tax deferred or, or a tax break on, on EV chargers. Yeah, I know in, in my neighborhood, one of our neighbors got an EV charger put in and he has a Tesla, not that I can afford one, but it seems like now everybody's like, ooh, we should get one. And I just don't know if there's some sort of incentive that people- There are for the cars, uh -huh. um, but that's based on the manufacturer and there are-, are uh, Yep, there's tax credit for cars. Those. There's also state incentives or rebates as funding permits for, for that. And that's going, all of that is designed to- uh, accelerate the market a bit so quite frankly the best thing is not ever pulling into a gas station yeah i can't tell you how happy that makes follow me. up to that the 7.5 billion dollars in the infrastructure bill is there any sense of how that's going to be distributed hmm. well i think some of the state money coming from that is going to the department of transportation and then they're they're the the gatekeepers and i think there's some funding that will be funneled through, I believe Efficiency Maine will get some of that to go back out and, and offer um, you know, rebates or incentives for installation of these chargers. Well, so new, they haven't figured out that yeah. distribution yet. And no. Efficiency Maine and others like Central Maine Power have offered grants for EV charger installations for commercial entities, but there hasn't been a whole lot on the homeowner side of things. Mm -hmm. And not a lot on that put a wire under your parking lot side of things either. <laughs> and sorry, sure. uh, just one other question. So when it, when based on the um, different businesses that you guys had listed, again, I can't recall for public spaces owned by Scarborough, would those all be 100% EV capable or is there a different plan that we have separately as a town where, you know, we would, do something maybe different above the ordinance again just to kind of set the way for the community to say we're going to proactively you know retrofit all of our parking at some point probably not all right away but just 
we, we haven't had that conversation. I'm interested in the committee's thoughts there. Mm -hmm. uh, we've we've tried to pick our spots carefully. We we do have probably not enough, certainly not enough, but we do have charging stations at the library and, and back yeah. in the town hall that are used consistently all day, every day. So clearly the need is there. Mm -hmm. One of the easiest ways to fill some of that need is to find out where your buildings are because you can mount these things on buildings and if they're close to a parking spot, then you, you can do that. You'll see a lot of charging stations on buildings because it, you don't need to do the underground work. Uh, so those opportunities present themselves quite readily to uh, a low cost solution for charging. Yeah. And so from that perspective, I think that the city would be looking at a couple of different categories. Again, that's not a part of this particular proposal, um, but looking at employees. So which buildings have employees in them mm -hmm. and starting to think about what fraction of employees should we be providing this kind of charging for, knowing that some are coming from places where they won't be able to charge at home. Mm -hmm. Um, and then also thinking about places where people spend time. So the committee has been talking about the beaches, ways to ensure that some of these tourist spots that people are coming from further away might have access to chargers, um, looking at some of these granting programs, and would certainly encourage, as the council is aware of spaces that are being redone, mm -hmm. um, to take that into consideration. It's my expectation that, um, that planning and and the sustainability coordinator and yeah. some of these folks can help to be on top of that. Floor. Yeah, because I, I was thinking of the Heard Park redevelopment we might be mm. doing and just thinking, how would that apply there with with charging stations? Because again, that just seems like a, to, to your point about the beach and people coming and going and visiting, like you would want probably, and people spend many hours there, so it would be a good place to charge. Um, just two more questions. If that's okay. Can I actually just chime in yeah. a little bit related to that? That um, the city of Portland just announced that they entered into a, an agreement with um, an EV charging um, company to um, bring EV charging to a number of their public parking lots, and it's costing the city zero dollars. So mm -hmm. they did an RFP process. They um, hired uh, or chose um, one of the companies, mm -hmm. and um, the company will reap all of the financial benefit. Um, but it, it's a service that the city is going to be able to offer um, and at, at zero cost to them. So I have reached out to their sustainability folks to yeah. see if I can get a copy of that RFP because I think that that is something um, that Scarborough should at least consider. Yeah. Just to think about some of the add-ons that they're gonna do with that in the city of Portland is doing the same thing. If you're charging and you've got a full tank, this will send you a text message that says, if you still remain at this space any longer, it is now a dollar extra a minute that you're mm -hmm. hooked up to our wire. Mm -hmm. So it, it can get really, really uh, sophisticated. You can go as deep as you want to, or you can go as easy as you want to. Mm -hmm. But all of these things are out there. They're mainstream now. They're off the shelf technology. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, I thought I thought it was an interesting provocation, Jamie. You said about in lieu fees because when i was reading it I, I asked myself as i was reading it i was like i wonder what the in lieu fees are when i was before i got to that section and i never really thought of well should we offer them or not and and what is scarborough's value as it relates to sustainability and with this particular ordinance so i think that's that's something interesting to talk about as a council to figure out is that really something that we would want to allow um which kind of leads me to my next question because i know it and the the packet it mentioned you guys met with the, the developers and got feedback i'm sure they would prefer to see an in lieu fee for various reasons i'm just curious were there other particular areas of concern or pushback that they had or as this moves forward what do you anticipate we're going to hear in terms of pushback they really don't want to do it at all okay <laughs> that's <laughs> yeah. that's their sense but but um <clears throat> and i forget which builder it was that said this he said it's not going to stop me from building here right yeah right. um mm -hmm. And I, I think they all acknowledge too that this is something that they need to be thinking about um, because they recognize that the um, trend the trend is changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, but we just don't want it to get to a point where they're thinking about it so far after the fact that then it's going to become cost prohibitive, and that's going to be um, a reason not to do it. So mm -hmm. um, at least planning during development at least at a minimum getting the conduit under their parking lots that seems like a really easy first step um 
in a way to, to make work with the transition and, and respond as the market requires mm -hmm. us to respond. So they said they just didn't want to do anything until customers were asking, but that's that sort of chicken and egg problem that the customers won't ask. Like if I'm yeah. moving into an apartment building with no chargers at all, I'm not going to be thinking at all about electric vehicles. But if I move into an apartment building that has one charger, mm -hmm. then somebody's going to start to use that and somebody else's, and we can start to, to move that, that forward. So the, the one other question I have maybe, and I don't know if you guys would know this, but from a technology perspective, you know, the fact that you have to have the unit like right in front of the parking space, is that, are there other technology designs where it's like lower to the ground, not quite as like up and in, in front? Because I just imagine a future where there's these things sticking up everywhere, well, which could be a little bit of an eyesore. And I love doing pull throughs when I park. <laughs> and so is this going to prevent me from doing that? Well, well, is it going to reduce yeah. the number of parking spaces? Yeah. You know, well, this you have, change yeah, the configuration yeah. of our parking lots. Mm -hmm. This is a bit of a background conversation here as well as to how many do we really need in some of these places. Mm -hmm. And I know that as an EV driver, I don't want them low because then they're covered with snow and I can't oh, get to the point. thing when I need to get access yeah. to it. But I think that the developers and the community can start to think about where those things should be. We've got stuff all over the parking lots already. We've got lighting fixtures and we've got mm -hmm. this and that and the other thing and if the electrical vehicle electric vehicle chargers are tied into those things mm -hmm. i don't envision a future where everybody that drives to hannaford pulls in and plugs in like i've charged outside of my home probably 20 times in nine years but when i need to charge i need to know where those chargers yeah. are and where i can access Thank you, guys. The other thing, too, that I really wasn't aware of when we started this conversation, correct me if I'm still out in the weeds on it, is that you can have one pedestal that will charge four cars. It just depends where you put it. So it's, okay. not, it's not like you need a charger for every car. Okay. You can have one charger that can, that can service four spaces. Mm -hmm. I feel like where I work, because I've been going in the office lately, they have EV stations now, and they seem to have one per spot, or at least that's how it felt. It's usually they're tandem. You have two plugs and they sit right in the middle line. And so you, you have access to both parking. Uh, it was interesting. Um, they're actually now putting a re, uh, recoil uh, on the pedestals now because people are leaving the cable on the ground. And then when it snows, it becomes mm -hmm. buried. So, you know, it's oftentimes like you go to a gas station and you got to pull and, and there's a guide there. Well, that's what some of these chargers now are starting to uh, to have as an accessory to keep them off the ground. But they do need to be up a bit. Uh, bullards are also used to, if you're you know in a parking spot where you don't have curbing or things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And again, too, you don't. A lot of times you have sidewalks uh, going in the front of the building, and you don't necessarily want them to climb over the cable as it goes across the sidewalk. So you have to cut out the sidewalk if you're gonna do a retrofit to put something in there. But if you already have the conduit already there, you know where it is in that sidewalk, you just chip away a little bit and you now you put your pedestal. And uh, it's, and then you can take it down if you don't use it anymore at that spot and you can put it somewhere else. But you have that flexibility because you designed your, your conduit in a logical uh, fashion. And that's up to the developers to do that. And they have the they have the brain power to do that. I talked to one of the in, uh, installers who was saying that yes, it's absolutely possible for a condo parking lot, for example, to have like the wiring there and the char like get a charger, put it in that spot, and then if somebody else has access to that spot because this person moved out, to move that charger to a different spot. But it's mm. not like they have to be tied to exactly where they were. So people are thinking about a lot of really cool things. Yeah. And I think it's not unreasonable to ask the developers to move in this direction. Mm -hmm. I, want, I wanted to go back to the in lieu uh, question of whether it should be in there or not. And uh, one of the reasons for having an in lieu uh, uh, fee is that uh, there may be some types of businesses that don't want to encourage people to park their cars for very long. You know, they have Dunkin' Donuts and Starbucks, which rely a lot on, oh, you know, turnover. They want people in and out. They don't want to create the impression that, hey, come on in and spend the afternoon 
because uh, it's using up a valuable parking spot and they need more turnover. Mm. So, you know, small businesses like that, that that require people to come in and out really quickly might choose to do the in lieu just because it serves their business model better. Mm -hmm. So there are no requirements for installations of very small things, but there may be larger businesses that also don't want to be like, there may be perfectly reasonable cases. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know what they are. Uh, we just wanted to see if there was a way to have a funding source so that the town could, on town-owned property, be able to do this and not not have the taxpayers foot the bill. Yeah, I just wanted, to, um, and a little slow for this, but uh, welcome and thanks for taking the initiative to help us get educated. When we were going through this in ordinance, it was quite clear, uh, at least I'll speak for myself, that I had a very low level of understanding on this entire topic. So so thanks for helping us to get rolling. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't, I just don't know if we're even on the map as a town yet. Uh, but I can't, other than the library and a couple of other places that I think at Beacon at Gateway, I just couldn't tell you where to charge your, mm -hmm. your car publicly. So, and as far as most of the development, uh, yeah, I don't know that this is a standard item either. So. So lots of questions, but I uh, appreciate you helping us get the dialogue going. Um, I did want to share just a couple of things. I you know we talked about in-loop fees. In general, I'm in favor of not having in-loop fees, you know, of having some framework so that we're encouraging developers, you know, to, to make commitments. So, and I did have a question though. Is there any, Jay, you'd probably be the best person to answer this. Given uh, what's pending today, you know, Costco parking lot, that sort of thing. Any talk about chargers there? Uh, actually, I'll let uh, Mr. Mine can take that up as he serves on the planning board. And though we don't have any standards for it, it's certainly a topic that comes up upon occasion. So it right does. With and, and this is probably if I was to do a full confession, and I would say that it's because of my time on the planning board that motivated me to say we need an ordinance because I'm tired of asking, could you please, could you please, do you want a waiver on smaller parking lots? Uh, okay, maybe that will work, but I'd like to see some chargers. Can there be some give and take? I don't get smiles when I say any of that. Uh, I don't get, oh, sure, we're excited to do that, or we'd love to, or you're putting in 795 parking spots, and oh, yeah, we'll put four chargers in for you. Uh, you know, it's it's probably to keep me from talking anymore. Uh, but yeah, it's very frustrating, Don, to know that, you know, we have oodles of multifamily buildings going up, single family homes going up, and we're not encouraging by any way uh, our developers to be active in in the state's goals, the the, the community's goals and taking care of their own people that are living there. Um, in ten, in the they're ten they're years, just, we're gonna be they'll them. only do what they have to do. So I just say as a priority, and this is kind of like a bifocal vision, let's get right away at the folks where there's activity and there are opportunities and let's try to move quickly on that if we can. And are there any uh, question, are there any local communities or regional examples where people have taken a position on it and are finding that it's working? where there's also, you know, We are cutting edge, Don, but Scarborough's always been known to be on a cutting edge of thing. At least at the sustainability committee, we like to uh, um, be the first, but there are, GP COG is a good resource. And I know one of your former colleagues is now part of that team, um, but they have provided us with some guidance. Uh, there are South Portland and Portland, but we're, we're really considered the early adopters here. Uh, so there isn't a lot. Um, you know, one of the comments that we heard from our stakeholder group is we need to go and, and find out what they're doing overseas and study it and figure it out. And uh, no, time out. We don't need to study that kind of stuff. It's, it's no different than putting in parking lot lights for the safety and, and, and uh, mobility of our community. It's nothing more than that. And so we don't need to study it. We don't need to have some role model out there that that does this for us uh we just use our own common sense and and understand what our customers need so one thing i just suggest that we try to keep in mind is you know i think it's great to have a playbook and try to follow it but let's try to balance that with you're not uh you know not stifling uh you know the interest level and you know this is going to be a demand thing you know nobody 
I don't know what the schedule is for for electric vehicles, you know, and, and I don't really know where we stand as a town or as a as a country in terms of that. But uh, it would be you know good for us to pick an area where we think we can have an impact and follow the you know the the current thinking on it. Uh, but at the same time, try to make sure that we get some principles. For example, like we're not going to be just offering folks places to plug in for free and not make sure at least there's a break even or that they're paying for it. You know, so I, you know, the, the ones that I know of right now, there's no, you can plug into the library all day and there's no yeah. charge for it, right? I think those are a lot too, is there's an educational value for that yep. as well. And I think it also sends a message. Uh, so it becomes part of the early adoption of this. Yeah, but your point's well taken. But thank you, thanks for your input. The primary thing is places where we expect people to stay overnight. So residents, uh, lodging, uh, like that would be the first key thing. Yep. Um, and then making sure we have some of this background infrastructure for people who are living in existing spaces to be able to make that transition as well. But I think about the idea of having to stay at some place long enough to get a full charge on a vehicle. You know, when I go to a place to shop, I'm trying to get in and out as soon as possible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Again, you're not trying to get a full charge when you're outside of your home. You're not really trying to get a full charge. You you know, with EVs, you've got to kind of you've got a certain range, and maybe today you've got extra places you need to go. Okay, I really would feel better if I had a little bit of a top off kind of thing. So let me stop in. I got to do some shopping at Walmart. It's going to take me 45 minutes. Oh, they got a level three charger. I can, I can almost fill my tank up for the so time it's going to be there. We won't be calling them filling stations. No more. So uh, no, no. One piece of information that might be helpful in, in sort of helping to understand the, the shifting paradigm of how people fill up their vehicles and I, I don't know the answer to this question so uh, but what is the typical range that we're seeing for EV vehicles is where I know you know number of years ago was pretty low 100 150 my understanding is it's much further beyond that and I don't know if anyone at this table knows that um, so a lot of around 400 miles yeah. a lot on, of on a typical day but then uh, there are other factors sure. if you use air conditioning or wintertime driving, wintertime or summertime driving, it can you know drastically reduce that. So 200 miles maybe in the summertime if you're using the air conditioning the whole time or in the winter or the heat. So for the but, most part, if someone's staying, going to work, doing their, their chores or whatever they do after work and going home, they're not having to fill up much like we don't with my gas vehicle, I fill up once a week. Right. hopefully only <laughs> um but so i think that that's part of that shift as well um and, and what you folks are talking about is really the focus on the residential piece because that's where folks well again not everybody the grocery store i right. think as you mentioned in nine years you've only charged a few times outside the home so right just, but again i need to know that those things know are there, there. Yeah. and i need to know that there's sufficient capacity so for in the debt i'm driving a legacy leaf that has like <laughs> 70, 50 in the winter. Like it's it's not that great in the winter. Yeah, we have one of those out there too. But <laughs> for, for me to, to use that to take the kids to hockey in Yarmouth is easy in the fall and is easy in the spring. But in the winter, if I can't count on being able to plug in there, highway driving is the other thing that drops your range, the speed. Like you don't have to think about it in your gas car. It's happening to you too. Um, <clears throat> but if I get there and somebody else is using the one charger, then I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. And so knowing that there are three here and one there and two over here makes it possible for me to move around in ways that it's simply not possible without that. I, I, just speaking from a, a personal viewpoint, I think, I think Ernie mentioned this before, the technology is changing all the time. Mm -hmm. And your point about driving with the, the heater on, I read the other day that the next generation of EVs, instead of making of hybrids, instead of having you drive your gasoline motor to make heat for your car, they're going to start using heat pumps in the cars. They are now. So this whole situation is changing. I just hate to see anybody be behind the curve so badly. And I think back to, I think maybe one of our very first discussions as a committee was about the conduits in single family homes, new construction. I had a uh, put a, a um, 
emergency generator in my house. I had to have the conduit run all the way from the other end of the house over to the garage. It just doesn't make sense to not have that conduit there when you build a building. Mm -hmm. That's And that's a very low level of interest. But um, in my extended family, there are four households and three of them are now driving electric or hybrid cars. And the fourth one's just waiting till he needs a car. So it's, it's moving so fast that um, we'd be missing the opportunity. We've missed other opportunities as a society with, with solar roofs that are uh, not being installed, even though they have ideal orientation. Um, and there aren't any that's, <laughs> Sorry? The, the, one, the one big paradigm change too, when you're building new homes is the electrical service. Way back when you probably bought your first home, it was 60 amps was probably the service you needed. And then we got to 100 amps where that's pretty much standard. Well, new homes going in that have heat pumps for heating and a heat pump water heater and now make it EV capable, <coughs> that's going to be 200 amps. So that's going to be the standard uh, for new homes. Now, you got to pay for the electricity coming to your house no matter what. It's not that big of a lift to go from 100 amp to 200 amps. But without that capability, then having a charger isn't feasible because you, you, you won't be able to run your dryer and, your, and charge your vehicle during non-peak times where you should be doing it uh, at the same time without tripping your breaker. So a 200 amp service is probably going to be your standard on new homes going forward. And it's primarily driven because of electrification. Uh, and that is through the heat pumps and EV vehicles. Rick, that brings up a good point. I, I, forgive me, does the ordinance as drafted uh, speak to the service? Capability? Yes, that's the different capabilities, having the electrical service available. How does the interplay, if at all, with the electrical code, which, which governs other parts of? Well, they have, to, they have to install it per the electrical code. That's that the code is telling you how to do it. Uh, but it's not telling you what the what the service what the service is required. The service what is required is whatever is going in in that home. So the load of that home uh, that can be anything. But standard is now pretty much a hundred. But it's starting to migrate to two hundred, as the real estate agent knows. And there are systems available now, but certainly not standard, that will shift these things. Like you don't need a, a larger available service, but they'll shift the availability to different, like- Yeah, you may not be able to run your dryer when you're charging your vehicle. I just want to make sure that something wasn't getting yeah. missed. Okay. No, no, uh, per, per, the, the electrical code will tell you the requirements to make it safe and do it right. Uh, there is the building and energy code uh, which we follow on the I IECC is our energy code. Um, there are provisions that uh, actually have it in the code that thou shall do this and thou shall do that. If we were to adopt the appendix of the 2021, this would be a moot point because all homes would be EV ready. So that's in the code. Th this is what occurred to me. I was trying to dig into a little bit today. I said, why isn't this part of the building code? Right now, because it, it seems, be. I mean, it will be in my living room. I have to uh, have a setup for a paddle fan, right? Even if I don't intend to put one up, but the code requires that I have it there in case I want to in the future. There's all kinds of little things like this. I'm like, really? A, a, an outlet in the garage? That I, I mean, I, but Don, to your point, there are a number of um, communities that have adopted an, an addendum to the building code. Uh, and it's very similar to the ordinance that we're looking at. So there's a couple of ways to. Yeah, what you can't do is you can't you can't adopt a more stringent energy code, but you can change your ordinance to increase things. But you can't uh, the home run rule um, for codes, building and energy codes isn't there. You have to either you follow this code or you're in violation. Now there's a population threshold where it's enforceable and not enforceable. Uh, and I think that's at 4,000. So if your population's under 4,000, you don't have to enforce it. But if you were to build something there, you still have to build it to that code. So it's coming whether we like it or not. We just want to get out in front of it and have it a way that uh, our developers can bring this into their, to their work plans as well. April, did you have questions? 
Uh, I did so many. So much of what I was going to say has already been said. The one thing that um, maybe we can touch on a little more is in terms of the feedback that we got from the stakeholder meetings. I mean, to your point, like all the developers said they, of course, they don't want to do this. They don't, they don't want to have something else added to their plate by the town. That would be a requirement. And then, of course, they had all kinds of reasons um, why this would be prohibitive. But when we're talking about actual cost, you know, what, what is the difference between making sure that the parking lots have the conduit versus making sure that they have the charging stations? Mm -hmm. like at what point, what are the thresholds that you guys were recommending? Like, can you talk about that a little bit? Uh, the, well, we we have a chart based on the number of parking spots that are required for the different facility types. Uh, so that's in the that's in the ordinance now. And then we took that table and we said, OK, this is our three tier approach, whether it's EV ready, EV capable or EV um, it's installed. And, and we took a percentage of that. And overall, we were thinking, you know, 100% on the residential side. It just, you know, why even mess around with that? And then on lodging, same thing. People spend the night there. They need to have charging capabilities. Uh, and then it begins to change as your, your building types change. Healthcare, you're in there for a workout for at least a minimum of an hour, right? So we ought to have a requirement that they have a certain level of, of charging installed right away. But then there's this percentage where you're just laying conduit. So I had reached out and, and he still promises to get it to me, uh, kind of the pricing it takes just to lay pipe. Um, and, you know, it's no different than running the, the pipe to your light that's in the parking lot. You're just going to run another one. So whatever that cost is, let's just say it's a thousand dollars a parking spot. Okay, then you say we're going to make it EV capable. That means you have power available. You have the electrical capacity. So you have a spot. So now you have to have a breaker. So you add the breaker cost in minimal. And then you then you could have EV uh, ready with just the, the conduit in line. And you can put these templates down and cement them in. And it takes a universal. It's like when you go and buy a TV and you need to mount it on your wall, you get the universal mount. And then you try to figure out which holes to put the screws in that match <laughs> up to your TV. And then you hang it. That's what these things are. They, they'll take all different types of TV. So you put those in. Those, I heard, run between 500 and 1,000 a piece. But you got to have that. And, and uh, I'll get back on the, on the cost uh, for laying the pipe. But that seems to be... Um, you know, we're focused on that. Do you want lifetime cost or life cycle cost? It's a no brainer. I just told you the difference in the gas prices. Well, so, so this is where we don't know how much parking lot costs and we don't know how much conduit costs. So we've been trying to get this information from right. them because it would be nice to know, is this 1% of the parking lot cost or 4%? I don't know. Um, because I've never built a parking lot. But PVC pipe isn't real expensive. And the glue to put it together doesn't cost much either. Yeah, I guess I can chime in a little bit on that. Um, it's really, I guess, to their point, when we talk about this in the committee, is about doing it when the hole is open, right? So that was the whole point of looking at development, uh, redevelopment thresholds, right? So when you start looking at are you how much are you actually tearing up pavement or parking and reconfiguring because once that hole is open and they're putting new gravels in and they're putting new pavement in, it's really, it's a linear cost, right? It's a linear foot cost. So if it's, you know, even $25 a linear foot, depending on where you're going and things like that, it's, it's a very minimal cost essentially in a larger scale project. So when you look at percentage wise, it's, it's pennies to throw in conduit under a, a, a hole that's already open. Uh, so I actually put conduit in my parking lot about 10 years ago and <clears throat> it was for lighting. Um, I, I put extra in and wound up using it for speakers for music um, down the road. If you think of it ahead of time, 
is mm -hmm. dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. Nobody today, like it's not built into anybody's processes, right? Your architects, your engineers, they're not designing parking lots for this. So um, it's just not worked into the system yet. So initially it'll be a little bit more expensive because it's not what people, it's not boilerplate. It's not what people are used to doing. Um, I wanted to see if we could have a little conversation. So I, I'm sold that it should be required uh, you know, to be ready in homes. Uh, we said 100% of hotel spots. So first off, you're looking ahead into the future. I'm hoping that we don't need as many parking spaces as we have. Maybe we'll get to a sharing economy. Maybe we'll become you know, more reliant on public transit. So I don't know about requiring 100% of anything. Uh, I, I'm hoping that we ha we're able to reduce the number of parking spots. Um, talk to me about the difference. So. And I don't, this might be in the ordinance and I forgot. It seems to me level three is kind of similar to going to the pump where you're, you're done in 15, 20 minutes. Level two, you need a, you know, a work day. Uh, when you're looking at some of these different uses, are you allowing for like, you know, if you put two in, in two level threes, you don't need to do the level twos or something and you don't need all the spots. Have you kind of started to weigh the pros and cons of that? They're not really replaceable in that way because if you're in the building working all day a level three that you only need for half an hour isn't necessarily what you want <laughs> like so for, go for, out an office. To, for an office building for <clears throat> how about for a grocery store well hannah and again my personal sense is that in terms of exactly how many need to be in what places the of the actual chargers that the market's going to drive that fairly nicely. Like many of the local Hannafords have installed level three chargers. And quite frankly, there are a couple of times I've gone to Hannaford because they have a level three charger and that's what they're counting on. Um, I don't know how many level three chargers we'll need in the community and how many of those will be put in place. So that's a piece that we're still talking about in the background and trying to gather more information. Um, Revision has just finished up a fairly extensive report for South Portland. Have we gotten a copy of that yeah, yet? Of it. We're trying to track down this, this report that's looking at exactly some of those things and may help us to refine some of the numbers. The other thing, I really liked what you said about how Portland is approaching it, which is, uh, I. To hit the, if we're really, these companies are really going all electric by 2030, that is not very far into the future. Mm -hmm. uh, by focusing on just new development, you, you're only going to hit a fry, you know, you're still going to be unprepared. So we need to kind of, I think, understand other paths. Well, um, remember that 2030 is when they stop selling the gasoline cars. And then those gasoline cars are still here for many years beyond there. Um, that transition is slower than, than that sounds like. Um, and a lot of the stuff that's here is going to have to be retrofit. Our point is we got to stop building stuff that isn't ready. We got to stop letting people build stuff that isn't ready. And people will have to retrofit and that will be an expense to them in the future. Yeah, mar market will dictate There's that. There's nothing though. that we can the, do about The demand that. will dictate. If, if your employer now realizes that uh, he has seven people that drive EVs and he has no charger out there, he's liable to put one out yeah. eventually. So you're going to have it, it'll it'll happen on retrofits. Well, uh, where it's really going to happen is the multiple, the, the big apartment buildings and the condo complexes, because they have see, nowhere to go. I don't see any EV chargers in those locations. Well, and California is ahead on that, just because they were requiring their fleet standards earlier than the country was, and so you see the major employers in California installing chargers because that's how they can get employees and if they don't have them they can't get employees and you start to see apartment buildings retrofitting because no one will rent their apartments if they don't have access to charging we're not there yet we're just asking you not to let them build anymore so, so let's talk about costco right that's a, a new development coming obviously they won't be held to whatever standards Unless we get this thing done quicker. <laughs> well, like, or, right. Or if they go slow. But what would you require of a, a development like that? What are you envisioning? Well, I think our ordinance, uh, we did talk about that. And I think we did did have some level three in there. Yeah, we're right now, um, The what is in the, the draft document is that um, we're looking at a 25% of their parking to... Um, to have chargers in the future. We're looking at 5% to 
to be um, have EV, 5% of the spaces to have EVs installed, 10% to be ready, and another 10% to be capable. So conduit to those other 10%. And right now we're looking at a mix of 50-50 between level two and three, but I think that those numbers can could be adjusted, um, especially knowing the amount of parking that Costco is is looking to have. Forty spots mm -hmm. required. And that doesn't sound crazy. Three. And those level three. Out of seven hundred ninety-five, that doesn't sound extreme. And I think if if the ordinance was crafted in such that the planning board would have some discretion on listening to the applicant and, you know, just like they come back to you, well, we didn't put enough parking spots in, we've got to increase our parking space. We try to listen to the applicant and if they're asking for more than what the ordinance says, they have it's the burdens on them to prove that they would need those extra spaces. Same thing, if they can prove that they wouldn't have the need for that many, I suppose the discretion could be left to the planning planning board. Rick, does it change the size of the parking lots significantly? It doesn't change the width or the length, no. 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 The, that question was from the multifamily houses and that if we were gonna require them to put in say two chargers to start with, they felt like they would need two new additional parking spaces for those two because they couldn't count on those spaces being used by somebody who was already there. Gotcha. So that's, so I think that we're having maybe two different, I, I literally meant the physical bank of chargers. Does that occupy more space so that you have to increase the overall surface area of the parking lot because it shouldn't have the to structure itself takes up space. It shouldn't have to. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of these apartment complexes have assigned parking. Well, you know, maybe they have to do things a little bit different to accommodate the, right. the that's, EV. And that's, 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 that's the point, point she's yeah. making. It's, it's their prerogative. We're just telling you, you gotta put them in. Right. How you wanna run it, that's your, your gig. And you could require your residents to buy the charger to put in the, so you can do all whatever you, we're not telling you what you have to do to make it happen. We're just telling you you have to be ready for people to be able to do that. So how about multifamily? So we've got a development that wants to come in with 330 units. How many are they going to have to put in? Well, according to, or what do you suggest? According to code, or according to our ordinance, they're required X number of parking spots. Probably a based on spot one bedroom, two like bedroom, yeah. whatever that total parking spot uh, requires that that space. Then we would do the percentages for multifamily. Right, so um, we're looking at overall future build out would be 100% of the spaces. Initially to start, they would, for, and this is for surface parking, not covered parking. There's a little bit of a nuance in there. So we're looking at 5% of the spaces to have um, chargers installed, 30% um, to be EV ready, and then 65% to be EV capable. Okay, I'm sold. That doesn't sound unreasonable either. That gives them total flexibility on where they want to put chargers as their as their population changes, or whether they want those chargers to be mobile. Like, yeah. it's only requiring a small upfront, but they're ready for the future when it when it right. Mm -hmm. okay. I didn't get that when I read the ordinance. So this this is having the conversation is yeah. helpful. Just a, a drafting thing. I might suggest you, the table here. If you could have the titles uh, carry on with the pages. Oh, with the pages. Sure. It'd just be easier to understand what all the different percentages mean. And the final version is probably not going to look sure. like what you have. Sure. Jay's going to work this out. I want to follow up <laughs> on right, right. Yeah. discretion to the planning board and, and perhaps even a waiver in certain. Mm, okay. They could apply for a waiver if they. Particularly for the smaller scale retail, uh, just the nature of the business. Uh, as Look, the, there's the, not much in there. No required installs. Was it under 225? We're just looking, feet. they're not required, not required Not required to do any installation. Mm -hmm. They are required to um, at least run the conduit um, and have some spots be capable right. in the future. And so again, that might be for employees as opposed to a Roman Joe's. A Roman Joe's? A thousand Duncan. square feet. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, a Dunkin' Donuts? 5,000 at the most. But even a Roma Joe's a Dunkin' Donut may need a charger for employees. Right. And so getting some conduit in place so that even an Aroma Joe's could put in a charger for the manager. <laughs> so, um, and 
for and for that example, we are looking at they, they'll have to have zero chargers installed. Five percent of the spaces would be EV capable or EV ready, and twenty percent would be um, EV capable. So again, looking at a, a maximum of twenty five percent of the spaces, and an Aroma Joe's has minimal space. Eight nine. Spaces. You know, I just want to make one point pretty clear on all this. What we're really talking about is minimums. If someone wants to come in today and say to the planning board, I'm making this all EV ready, EV capable, EV whatever, that's fine. They can do that today. These are minimum requirements. Right now, all we have is Rick Mine King as a planning <laughs> board member say, please, pretty please. <laughs> saying please. Um, but again, so, you know, um, to your point, if the Dunkin' Donuts manager wanted one today, they would just come in, get an electric permit. We would take a look at the site plan, be sure it's not in the way. To your prior point, these don't typically get in the way of parking spaces and they put them in. Um, so there's been a number of sites. I think the Hannaford's, I, I'm trying to remember which Walmart. it wasn't. Walmart, Walmart was a retrofit. Walmart was a retro, retro that, that Those were the bigger units there, but there's been other sites that have put some smaller ones like we did out back and it's, very straightforward. Jamie, you've done so well with the, I want to talk me through a hotel. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, so hotels, we're looking at um, having, again, a future build out at 100%, 10% um, installed to start, 10% EV ready, and then 80% EV capable. So you scare me when you said 100% earlier, but when you say it that when way. When you say it that way, not so bad. Yeah, not so bad, just the conduit. And if they don't eventually need all the parking spaces, well, hooray for them. Right, you know. um, but the parking spaces they have should have conduit. But now they could come to the planning board, for example, and say, well, because of drainage and issues with that particular part, we don't really want to put anything there. Uh, the planning board would, if they're allowed to have some discretion, could work with the applicant so that everybody feels like they walked away winning. We got what we wanted, they got what they wanted, and now we have another tax uh, revenue stream. So I didn't know if this would go the full time, but it's been a, a really yeah. interesting discussion. We have a few minutes left. I wanted you to, are there other initiatives that you guys have going on that you wanted to kind of just clue us into? What's on your radar? What's important? And, uh, well, at some point here, we got to get more solar panels on more of these buildings. Um, that was a a trial balloon all those years ago and we've now bought out those first couple of thanks to you folks that voted on for buying out the ppe that we had but uh, there was a we list. now own those there was a longer list than two uh when that was initially done we could certainly move forward with additional ones um, one thing we're working on that we'd really need your help with is it's in our comprehensive energy plan mm. is we needed some sort of revenue stream to continue to work on municipal buildings and the efficiencies. And in that comprehensive plan, it says if we do X and we save X from that project, oh, yeah. Y goes into a bank account for future Xs. But where do I go? Uh, y was never established as a percentage of that, but that's, um, and that it did say in the comprehensive plan that the town council would decide. And that's at least in part so that we have some cash at the ready because some of these grants that come available have a match and y'all cannot move fast enough for us to get something ready to access a match and we lose all of those opportunities. We are typically for pretty slow moving. <laughs> yeah, so if we, but we understand had too. a sinking fund that had parameters, like we don't get to buy coffee, um, but that was available for some of those like grant access and things. That's what we've been looking for for about So what, what we're trying now. to do is have a revolving way that we can jumpstart some projects and have that cash because we did other projects that saved. Kind of like the land bond, right? We have it. We kind of want some of the money stuff. back so that we could continue to do more. Well, and we've already saved y'all money and we're going to keep doing that. We don't do things that don't save money. Um, but does we, anybody add it up? Does anybody quantify it? We so do sometimes. Problem in terms of benchmarking and being able to calculate that savings over time, particularly with a project. So maybe that's something that, how do we calculate it? Because you, you, you might get support for earmarking those saved funds. For well, we, we can certainly calculate the savings we've done with the streetlights. Well, that's, that's very quantifiable. All, right, frankly, all the LED streetlights that we replaced. And, uh, and, and we quantified the solar lights as well, remember? 
the solar yeah, the solar, panels. Yeah. solar panels. Solar panels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's right. We did. Yeah, I know. Yeah, there was an annual cost savings, I think. Yeah. I know, because I remember I ran the numbers on it. So if you want to say 25 or 50 percent of those savings go into a sustainability fund <laughs> We're not even so that we could go back out, we, we'd be okay with that. And you count the winners and the stay gainfully so. employed in the committee. They're not all winners. Oh, that's fair. Right, like Trigen. That, you know, I don't know that that was a, that was, you know, a winner in the long run. So. But some mechanism. Well, I think it's I think it's a win. Are there uh, examples of what our communities might do for in terms of funding sustainability? There are a lot of models out there. Some are pretty complex, and others are basically looking at um, at the the payback for the investment um, and and calculating when you expect to kind of break even on that investment um, and taking a, a portion of that to um, to continue funding sustainability projects. Electrification is is the big thing. We we have to reduce greenhouse gases. And one of the easiest ways to do that is stop combustion, right? We have combustion in our cars, greenhouse gas. We have boilers in our basements, greenhouse gases. Let's get rid of those and put in electric heating and cooling. So now we have heat pumps and in these commercial buildings, are the variable refrigerant flow systems, which are nothing more than an elaborate heat pump system, but you can use one outside unit and put 40 indoor units. Great for schools, classrooms, those kind of things. We can start doing those retrofits in our own buildings here in Scarborough. Um, and if we do it soon, uh, there's some federal money coming for municipalities and schools that the governor is handing to an A agency to give it out in terms of energy efficiency in schools and municipalities. And, and, and. So I see, to say about that. I seem to remember the school <laughs> budget having like, like consistently, every, we have hundreds of heat pumps, I think, and especially at the middle school. Yeah. Um, well, those are water source heat pumps because they have a geothermal. Uh, at the middle school? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. Uh, Same thing with the town, Wentworth. with the public. Wentworth. Wentworth. That's yeah. right. Wentworth. Wentworth does. The middle school, they have, I think, your, your standard units for are they air to air? Uh, if they're in tie, if they're tapped into the air conditioning, then they'd be uh, air to water heat pumps because they'd be using a closed loop. Well, I don't know, but where I was going with that was <laughs> where were you going with that, John? <laughs> is, there a, is there a connection between you guys and when we put together our capital improvement or maintenance budget? We want to be at the table anytime you're putting money together. So, <laughs> so maybe we have to try to figure out how to create that linkage. The other thing that I've been batting around for a while is. Um, changing procurement rules to look at a longer life cycle analysis. And so a lot of times municipalities get into trouble with their procurement rules that don't let them spend a little bit more now to save a whole lot more later. Um, 20 years ago, um, somebody was given a talk from Oberlin that just sticks with me. And he said when he got Oberlin to change from a three-year planning, like three years of, of costs to 10 years, there were so many more things that he was able to do um, when they were including 10 years of energy costs in thinking about how to buy something. So Tom, we're, now- I'm We're gonna be here 10 years. You're we're gonna read Pandora this year's box. budget with sustainability in mind. <laughs> uh, so it's timely. Good, Sorry. we're the last group in before they start their budget. <laughs> Refresh on your <laughs> mind. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there are school buses that, you know, your fleet vehicles have a, a fleet replacement program that you have out there. The procurement said that you have to go, um, every third vehicle purchase has to be an EV. That's a start. You can buy three a year, right? And well, one of them should be an EV. buses are perfect EV because of the usage patterns. So they're used heavily for a couple hours, then they're not used for a bunch of hours. And you may need a few that have the ability to drive all day long. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Island just got an, an electric school bus. And how many times have you gotten complaints about buses and cars idling while they're waiting for their kids? Well, you don't idle an EV, right? Mm -hmm. So those buses would sit there and yes, they'd have a heat pump for heating so the they could keep the cab warm to a certain degree, uh, but then no emissions. <laughs> and so we be happy to use some of the sustainability funds to help see purchasing of these kind of things. If we had. 
If we only had. We've turned into law barracks. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for asking the question, though. No. We're talking about electric buses. The school department just just wanted yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <Or the timing. laughs> um, it, Great. Any other comments or things you'd like to share with us? You know where we are. We do now. Well, we are also looking at codes and seeing how, you know, there's a stretch code in, in Maine that uh, has been adopted. Um, you know, is there, is there a reason to maybe go from just using our baseline code and, or to, and move forward with the stretch code? Thank we can you. study that a little bit more if you wish. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> What's the stretch code? It is the, <laughs> it, it is better than the code. It's, so you have the base code and then the stretch code is nothing more than adding aspirational type. And so well, it adds incremental savings to it. Okay. Yeah. And so requiring better installation. I mean, if we could get to where builders had to provide their clients options, like you can pay this much for this insulation or this much for this insulation, then I think we'd start to see people making some different decisions, but people don't know that they have choices to make. And they're not presented those choices when they're making decisions. But that's, yeah. I, I always thought that the code was that you had to be R30 or above. Apparently we're not there right now. No, you, mean you actually can get to 60. Yeah. Okay. And passive house, you could go to a passive house standard yeah. and you get 0.3 air exchanges an hour. Can you imagine? Right now our code says you can only change your air three times an hour. That's the code today. The stretch code could increase that and say it's the passive house standards, which is 0.3. So the codes are minimum, minimum standards. And there's way better that can be done. And so some of these stretch codes require some of those steps toward way better. Okay. And we don't adopt the stretch code right now. I'm looking at Jay. No, we have not. Okay. No. The, the baseline code is actually the, the makes you build the least efficient building that you can legally build that, that's is code. Yeah. And I will just say the stretch, we only got the option to adopt a stretch code in 2021. Right, that's so just came a very new concept. Okay. Um, and right now I believe only Portland and South Portland have adopted the stretch code as their energy code. Okay. It's just worth noting that, uh, you know, all of these conversations need to be balanced with the issue of affordability. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's a huge issue in our town. And I, I think Deb's quite right. If someone is to take the time and has the resources to make that upfront investment, which may in some cases be higher, but life cycle costs will pay for itself. Right. But uh, many folks are just doing what they can just to roll their coins and make that house purchase and right. don't have the ability. So I, I don't- Well, and that's where you see some communities like Cambridge, Massachusetts has offered municipal funding, kind of like not, not to buy things, but loan funds rolling loan funds to help make some of those transitions it may because have what that we're today. asking our low-income families and in, to do is to continue to pay those energy costs forever well it's not just sure. low income though i mean and that what this will happen trust me i would love to see stretch code but the reality of it is builders are going to pass that along mm -hmm. so it will make all housing prices go up and that's what we don't need right well, now. Well, there's, there's a lot of education that has to happen. It costs about $30 to go from an, uh, a three ACH to 0.3. It's called a couple of tubes of caulk. But people yeah, don't know. Yeah, but I'm just, say, I'm just saying that that's the pushback. I agree, the because, pushback because we don't, they, yeah. they don't know. And, and we're not a licensed state. So, you, you know, the biggest investment anybody makes in their lifetime is their home. And right. you don't even need to have anybody licensed to build that home. No, and, and these factors or should inspected. be part of the equation. The affordability is uh, is your total house, uh, total uh, income as compared to your housing costs. And those housing costs need to include principal and interest for servicing a mortgage, taxes, energy costs. So I, I think even up front with some additional investment up front, if you look at what it's gonna cost you to heat your home, uh, very quickly you can cover those dollars. Yep. Yeah, when those Actually, things, are rolled, into, when those things yeah. are rolled into mortgages, it um, it's usually lower cost <clears throat> from day one. Is it is it all or nothing in terms of adopting a stretch code, or can you yeah, adopt? It's, it's all or nothing at this at this point. juncture, unless Mubeck decides to to dilute it a little bit. It's either all or nothing. Yeah. yeah. 
And I'll just close by saying, if you ever go to Legoland, <laughs> and you look at the models in Legoland, you'll actually see they have now air source heat pumps attached to the sides of buildings in Legoland. I know that because we took our 10 year old grandson to the one in New York. I looked, that's a heat pump on that building. So it's coming whether we like it or not. Well, what a great way to end it. Um, so we're gonna adjourn this. We're gonna get back together in about three minutes for our regularly scheduled meeting. So thank you guys for coming. Thank you. Very and helpful. I'm sure you'll hear more from us in a smaller group and then hopefully again when vote has to be taken. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you. I guess.
think we're good if we can see. Okay, there we there are. There we go. All right. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Welcome. This is the Wednesday, April 6th, regular meeting of the Scarborough Town Council. I'll call this meeting to order and if you'll join me on the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Tody, would you call the roll call? Yes. Councilor Sider? Here. Councilor Anderson? Here. Councilor Katarina? Here. Councilor Hamill? Here. And Chairman Cucci? Here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is item four, general public comments. Is there anybody here that would like uh, to comment on something that is not on our agenda tonight? And seeing nothing in person, is there anybody online that would like to comment? Seeing no hands raised. Uh, we'll move on to the minutes from our March 16th, 2022 regular town council meeting and our March 30th, 2022 special town council meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second? Okay. Second. Any discussion? And all in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Next is any adjustments to the agenda. Does anybody have any adjustments they would like to see made to the agenda? And seeing none, I signed the treasurer's warrants uh, before this meeting. And item eight is the town manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, couple quick points. Uh, budget, of course, has been kicked off and underway. I suspect later on this evening, perhaps the finance chair will provide an update, but uh, they did meet yesterday, uh, organized kind of the schedule and process. So we're we're off to the races, so to speak. Our budget portal is up and populated and we'll continue to add to that as we produce more materials. Uh, there will be a special edition of the e-newsletter coming out tomorrow. It's solely focused on the budget. So I think it's gonna be a good resource for folks to, uh, to get engaged in the process if they wish. Um, also our audit at long last is in our hands. I have copies of it here. So by all means, uh, we have copies for members of council. If you wish to take one on the way out, please do. Uh, it's also available online on the website. Uh, that might be easier for you to, to look at it. Uh, and regarding the audit, we have worked with our colleagues on the school side. There will be a joint presentation, a meeting with the auditor for both, both bodies to meet with the auditor. And we're going to combine that with the uh, joint workshop and public hearing in the budget. So that's May 4th. And it's going to be a, a fairly long night. We have a regular meeting after that. So we'll have to, I'll work with leadership on the timing, but it does make sense while we have both bodies convened to be efficient with that time. And I guess the final piece on audit, uh, council may recall, this is the last year of our current auditor and we have gone through a public process, have identified and actually have three firms that have expressed interest and provided a response to our RFP. Uh, this Friday, I know uh, Chair Clucci and perhaps uh, uh, Councillor Anderson uh, are to be part of uh, dare I say interviews, it's more of a conversation to meet the auditing team to get a better sense of what their approach and and uh, and really meet the people that we'll be uh, working with. Uh, so we're excited about that opportunity. Ideally, we'll bring that uh, recommendation to the finance committee uh, if possible, and then ultimately it's a point, uh, appointment of the council. So pleased to have that process underway. Uh, also the uh, dredge project, this is something I've reported on in the past. Uh, Pleased to report that, uh, as I've previously reported, there'll be kind of two phases. The first phase will happen actually in May of this spring. This will address the most uh, egregious of the situations, I guess. It's the shoaling that's occurred on the mouth of the river, way out uh, kind of in the bay. Anyone that's been down on Pine Point at low tide, uh, you can nearly walk all the way to the Protzenek Yacht Club uh, with all the shoaling that's occurred. And so the, the mouth of the river, which is the kind of navigational channel is very challenging at all tides, but particularly low tide. So the Army Corps, to their credit, uh, recognize kind of the urgency and they're actually sending up uh, an Army Corps dredge ship. Uh, typically it's contracted labor that performs these uh, maintenance dredging, but this one is uh, such short notice, they'll be sending up their own uh, dredge, dredge ship. Um, so very excited for that. We're working out the, the final logistics with them in terms of where the crews, you know, where the ship will be tied up overnight and they have some shoreside uh, support that needs to happen as well. 
I'm also working with Senator Collins' office at this point and perhaps others in the legislative del delegation uh, for some earmark funding. This is uh, officially called congressionally directed spending, but it's the old uh, earmarks that uh, have come back around. And this is really to fund this near-term um, phase of the dredging, which was not planned. It was really kind of emergency basis. And I've received very good indication that uh, we're in line for the earmark funding to make sure this happens. Uh, I see Todd Susan in the audience. Uh, the Parks and Facility Master Plan process is well underway. I believe uh, today and tomorrow uh, are a series of focus groups, uh, kind of stakeholder meetings. This is uh, was always part of the process to to really kind of um, you know bring a lot of folks into the conversation early on. Uh, and I know there's uh, at least one public meeting in the initial part scheduled for April 27th at 6 p.m. Uh, we've had some feedback from folks about these. These are all virtual. Uh, it's not necessarily a preference, but it's really the most efficient way to do this uh, in a fairly short period of time. Our consultants are, uh, are also not local. Uh, and so uh, it just makes sense to do at least this step virtually. But as we move forward, we'll try to do mo uh, more and more in person as well, or at least provide that option. Uh, two other quick things. Um, just want to recognize Captain Granada at the fire department. Uh, he applied for a life jacket grant. If you've been down to the Pine Point Co-op, there is a stand for life jackets. Uh, and it's really just a loaner program. So if someone shows up, wants to get on the water and either forgot or didn't, doesn't have enough life jackets, they can take them and, and return them when they come back. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a no local match requirement. Uh, we'll be getting 12 children, 12 youth and 12 adults uh, life jackets to replace the ones that are there. And this is made possible through the CETO Foundation. So to his credit, we're applying and securing that grant. And last, I just want to make uh, the council aware some of you may not be aware of this, but the town has been involved in a federal lawsuit since 2019. Uh, Michael Doyle uh, took, the, took the town to federal court uh, before the U.S. District Court, I believe, in 2019. And this, this is about an incident that happened way back in 2017 at a public meeting. Uh, and uh, the, the complaint included four different counts alleging a number of different constitutional violations. Uh, so that, that suit did fail initially at the district court level. It was then appealed to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. And just last week, we learned that uh, that uh, appeals court affirmed the district court decision. So the next stop, should he choose to, is to the U.S. Supreme Court. So that, that's a much higher standard, but that's certainly a possibility. I'll keep you apprised. Uh, but certainly, I wanted to report to the council and to the public that... Uh, uh, the current status of that suit. With that, I'm available for questions. Questions for Tom? Council Ham? Yeah, not a question, but a comment on uh, dredging. You know, it's great news that that's happening. That was the first phase of that this spring. That's that's really great news. Uh, and I know Tom and staff and others have worked hard to make that happen. So mm -hmm. that's great. I, I also just want to mention there are a number of people who have expressed uh, <clears throat> questions about where the I guess they call it spoils, you know, where the material mm -hmm. from the dredge will be placed. And apparently 30,000 cubic yards are gonna be placed at uh, Little River Rock. Correct. In the water there, you know, that's the, right near the OOB Scarborough town lines. And 100,000 cubic yards are gonna be placed on Western Beach, which is over near, at least initially on Western Beach. So the reason I'm bringing that up is that a number of people have asked me about and these are particularly people in the Pillsbury Shores area where there's been erosion, uh, in particular around the, the end of the, uh, of the jetty near Heard Park. So um, I just you know, want to make uh, the council aware of that, number one, and number two, that uh, you know, they're, they're interested in trying to find a way to, to see where uh, some of that material may ultimately be placed. Yeah, I could speak quickly to that. Uh, the, the material, this 30,000 yards that will be removed this spring, uh, really is being done on a kind of emergency basis, if you will. The designated dump site, uh, it's about three miles offshore, approximately on the Scarborough uh, Old Orchard line, and it's a designated dump site. So it doesn't require additional uh, environmental review and approvals, it's already designated. So I think in, in light of the fact that they don't have much time to plan for this, uh, that's what they intend to do in the near term. Uh, longer term, next year, uh, for the bigger dredge, which is at least 100,000 cubic yards, 
there is interest in um, in Western Beach, uh, beach nourishment to put the sand back where it came from in large part. That's not to say that we couldn't also do that elsewhere um, and share some of those spoils elsewhere. I will say that each of those require its own regulatory review and approval through something called a beneficial re, uh, reuse license. So our challenge, Don, I think would be to convince uh, the feds and others to do the additional work for multiple beneficial use permits. Um, I have made them aware of our interests, so I'm hopeful we'll at least have a seat at the table. Great, thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, next is order number 22-025, a seven o'clock public hearing and schedule a second reading on the proposal to repeal and replace chapter 1007, the cable TV ordinance. Uh, this was uh, on our agenda last time we spread out. So we're having just a public hearing and scheduling the second reading as opposed to combining them. Tom, is there anything that you want to refresh us on with this? Really, just for the public's benefit, uh, this is a comprehensive repeal and replace. It's some 30 pages. Uh, I have a, a high degree of comfort. Uh, we participated with 13 other area communities, hired a, a, a national expert in cable uh, franchise law uh, to come up with this model ordinance. I can, I think I was asked in a previous meeting, I know Yarmouth and New Gloucester have adopted that the model ordinance, uh, the, the, the exact same one that we're looking at now and others are in line over the course of this year to do the same. Um, so uh, this is a precursor to the next step, which is to renegotiate our franchise agreement with our charter communications, but we really need to have a modern um, up-to-date ordinance that reflects current technology and also uh, the state of the law. The law has changed quite a bit over the last several decades. And uh, so for all those reasons, I highly recommend that we do modernize uh, as the first step. Very good. Any members of the public that would like to speak to this topic? Seeing none in person and none online, I'll close the public hearing and do I have a motion to schedule a second reading? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Okay. All in favor? That's unanimous. Thank you. Next is order number 22-026, a seven o'clock public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 302 council rules and policies manual, subsection 203.0.e, members to the communications committee. And this is again, a second hearing and a public, uh, second reading and a public hearing. It came to us from the communications committee. Uh, John, would you like to introduce it? Sure. Yeah, we, um, this year when we were setting our communications committee goals, we talked about different things we might wanna try and do. And one of the, the comments that was raised was potentially updating our charge to include the word engagement, which is a slight change to the charge itself. But I think that word means a lot. And that we recently had our, our first um, Counselor Corner Live, which was again intended to drive engagement, two-way engagement with the public, which was a pretty big success, at least in terms of turnout. And so I think it just shows that there's a desire by the public to, to find other mechanisms to engage the council. And I think charging the communications committee to expand um, our charge a little bit with just that slight word goes a long way. Any members of the public like to speak to this item? Seeing none in person and none online, uh, this is a second reading as well. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. Yeah, and I'd like to just say that this, well, this is just a small wording change. I think it portends uh, some great things potentially in terms of how we can actually uh, get people not only aligned with messaging and developments in the community, but also to get them to sign on to take action you know to join committees and to become part of the solution mm -hmm. so um i'm encouraged by this and i think it's symbolic but also uh um uh i think very opportunistic and uh very positive very good we're gonna try to lower lower the burden all in favor it is unanimous. And just so everybody knows, we're shorthanded today. We're, we're uh, typically a seven member body and we're down to five. So uh, I did coordinate beforehand if there are any uh, topics that anybody found particularly uh, controversial, we were gonna try to table those. So uh, that has not come up yet. Uh, 
Next up is order number 22-027, a seven o'clock public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 302A, committee's boards manual relating to the charge for the community services and recreation advisory board. Uh, this is coming to us from the community services and recreation advisory board. And uh, Tom, who would like to introduce this? Uh, Councilor Hamill's ready. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, well, are you are you doing the amendment? I, I just mean the overall topic. Uh, you know, I can I introduce we're it. staff, and then I'll. Okay, I'll we'll get on. we'll come back to this. So I can I can uh, just to recap. This was brought forward last meeting for our first reading. This is a proposed expansion to uh, the complement of, of members to this committee. Uh, it was proposed by uh, proposed by community services. And uh, again, I think the details are in the memorandum here, but it essentially expands the charge uh, and uh, better outlines, I think, the purpose of getting a diverse representation of the community on the committee, as well as adding two additional uh, school school department uh, attendees, students uh, to the committee. Thank you for that. Any members of the public like to speak to this item? Seeing none in person. And then online, I'll close the public hearing. And do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Uh, I'll open it to discussion, but I know Council Hamill has an amendment to propose. So why don't we go uh, first to his amendment uh, that he was he shared with us beforehand? Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. I apologize for the late breaking nature of this, and I I just want to reassure everyone: I am not by nature a tweaker, you know, kind of a my, you know, not typically detail oriented. But in a weak moment, I was looking, uh, <laughs> I was looking at uh, the minutes captured uh, our real time changes that we made at the last meeting, and true to form, uh, there was a glitch. We didn't; those were not somehow carried forward in the package. So uh, I'm offering a an amendment to get uh, the. You know that first paragraph uh, corrected and tightened just a little bit. I could, Councilor Hamble. Uh, thank you for pointing that out. We actually replaced that, so what is in the packet now uh, is the corrected version. So, <laughs> Toby assures me, uh, but I know you had uh, further clarification I, that you, you wish to offer. Yeah, I so I believe the green text, right? Your amendment is not in the package. Okay. It's separate because it wasn't. It's right. So I'm I'm offering this as a as a further refinement. Yes. That's exactly right. That's the green text. I believe. Yeah. See how many colors we have going on. Here? Yeah. yeah. John, can you can you tee up your amendment? Sorry, can you tee up your amendment a little bit here and just. Yes. I I mean, I can see, obviously I can read it, but can you under, you know, explain yes, a little bit about- I'd be happy to. Thank you. We spent a fair amount of time trying to clarify uh, the uh, desire that we'd not have uh, voting, not have student representatives as voting members. So there was still some language in there that was, was confusing. So I'm offering this as a further refinement uh, to make sure we're very clear that it's seven voting members, two alternate members, those folks will be for three-year terms, two non-voting student representatives, both from the high school for one-year terms, serving without pay to be appointed by the town council. That, that stricken language of the blue there was redundant. Terms will be staggered, and uh, these just basically reinforce the rules that are currently in effect, in effect and the voting privileges that were stricken there also was, was consistent with what we did last time. So in short, we're trying to illustrate less is more, number one, and number two, why we really don't like doing things real time <laughs> as a council in terms of drafting languages. So, but that's that's the intent and the, you know, the hope. <laughs> so so we'll accept that as a, a motion. Thank you. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. And discussion on the mo main motion as amended. Uh, just, Councilor Anderson. Yeah, I mean, I think it, on the it, amendment. it reads clear to me and I think is in the same intent of what was proposed by the committee. So yeah. I think it's fine. And, uh, you know, Councillor Clucci and I were spending time together this morning over coffee down at the Beechwood and uh, we didn't, you know, we 
didn't just stumble across you, this. I had caught <laughs> caught it reading it. You can't get us together so, without us trying to change something, right? Just uh, we'll it, so that. yes, I support this. I was I was guilty um, <laughs> thank, of introducing the change. And uh, special thanks to the patients and you know, <laughs> just sheer will of. Uh, of these two committees of community services and the rec advisory board they've been very patient and and incredibly thorough and all of this so thanks this is the i promise you the last step <laughs> that is correct this is, is it. Yeah. <laughs> the last step literally um, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, quick. <laughs> is there any other discussion <laughs> So we need to vote on the amendment. Yes. So there's two steps, sorry. Uh, all those in favor of the amendment is unanimous. Any discussion on the main motion as amended? Mm -hmm. Seeing none, all those in favor of the main motion as amended, and it's unanimous. So now you're done. Okay. Thank Until you the God. next time. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, and another one that, that we've been working on for for a little bit now is uh, order number 22-028, which is a 7 p.m. public hearing and second reading on the proposed amendment to chapter 302A, committee's board's manual relating to the merging the Conservation Commission and Pest Management Committee. And this was initially brought to us from the Conservation Commission and the Pest Management Advisory Committee. Um, can you help me tee it up? Or am I looking? <laughs> Sure. Uh, so in, in brief, uh, this is a proposed consolidation or combination of the Conservation Commission and the Pest Management Committee. Effectively, the Pest, Pest Management Committee charge would fall under the, the Conservation Commission. So um, all the, the ongoing responsibilities and expectations of that committee would be rolled into the Conservation Commission. So that's in a nutshell what this is about. You did better than I would have. Thank you. Uh, any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Come on up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Randy Hogan. And uh, I just wanna say our town is really fortunate to have a number of subject matter experts and passionate advocates for our natural resources here in Scarborough. And uh, also really fortunate that the council has uh, appointed and named several of those residents to the Conservation Commission. And I'm grateful um, to serve and privileged to serve as chair of the Conservation Commission. Uh, we're unanimous in our support, as you well know, from the documents that you have um, about this recommended merger with the Pest Management Advisory Commission Committee. We're delighted to have had multiple conversations over the last couple of years about this possibility. Uh, when then Councillor Clucci and now Councillor Scyther were part of those conversations and sat in on our meetings. We're also very pleased that town staff has thoroughly reviewed this, that the town attorney has reviewed it as well, and that council committees have brought it forward to this point. Um, I just want to underscore that the proposed merger gives us no new authority. Um, we, in fact, have no authority. We only have the pleasure of advising and recommending. Um, you're the body with the authority, and we thank you for using that tonight to approve this merger. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hogan. Any other public comment? Okay, seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. <clears throat> Any discussion? Councilor Katarina. Now, I know that I said no last time, and in part was because I, I had concerns about losing, um, you know, what pest management was set up to do, which was to make us more aware of pesticides and effect on um, our environment and whatnot, because at, when, when it was set up, Scarborough, I, as I recall, was in the leadership in that. It was saying, you know, we wanted to have pesticide-free playing fields and public spaces and whatever. Um, I did, um, as you know, when I left, I said, someone can convince me, I'll vote otherwise. So I did have a great conversation with Marla Zando, who's been on the Pesticide Management Committee since its inception. So you will be happy to know that I am changing my vote tonight. So thank you. Counselor. That's it. 
Councilor Hamilton. Yeah, building on that, I also wanted to thank uh, Marla Zando for her letter to the council, which uh, uh, as a co-chair of the Pest Management Advisory Committee, you know, uh, recommending and advocating our, our approval this evening. So thanks for that. Any other discussion? We don't have any secret amendments to offer up on this one. Okay. Uh, I was disappointed. <laughs> so I'm going to call the vote. All those in favor. It is unanimous. We're having a good night tonight. Um, <laughs> sorry. Thank you, guys. Uh, next is order number 22-033, a 7 p.m. public hearing and first reading on the following new request for a marijuana license. A Coastal Maine Cannabis LLC located at 10 Snow Canning Road, Units 1 and 5, for an adult marijuana cultivation facility. And B, Potland LLC located at 71 Pleasant Hill Road for a medical marijuana cultivation facility. And schedule the second readings for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022. Liam, would you like to introduce us? Sure, thank you. Um, so both of these uh, proposed licenses are existing establishments in large part. Uh, Coastal Maine Cannabis is proposing to make the migration their existing uh, licensed medical marijuana cultivation facility. Uh, they're proposing to move into the adult marijuana facility uh, or adult marijuana establishment uh, licensing. Uh, Potland LLC, uh, same, uh, really same situation. They are an existing uh, establishment that's been licensed previously, both have been inspected, staff have no concerns. Thank you. Any members of the public that would like to speak to this item? Seeing none in person and none online, I'll close the public hearing. And do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion amongst the council? Council Anderson. I just, I just have a question because I know <coughs> snow canning when I first joined, that's where we got a lot of complaints, I think, about smell. And we haven't been getting much complaints lately, except through one resident, I think, an email we got today. So I'm just curious, have, have there been other complaints that have come in, or have they been mostly resolved? <coughs> Good question. Uh, I We do have an, an odor report survey available online uh, that I that I periodically monitor. In terms of uh, written complaints or concerns, I, I have not received any directly of late beyond the one that the council received today. Um, I will say that that is a uh, that facility, uh, I think, continues to improve their order mitigation systems. Uh, we've been through through the renewal process, at least half of the facility again. I know that uh, the building owner has been working to install systems in common areas that previously weren't there. Uh, so I still think there's a concerted effort to, to improve that. Um, but, uh, you know, I think there's some challenges with that facility, the age of the facility. I think it's, it's a kind of naturally a porous footprint. Uh, so I think that those kind of those efforts will, will improve it. Um, also, the proximity that facility has to residential neighborhoods, um, I think, is another, uh, I think, another kind of common theme we've seen. Um, so in terms of the question is, have I received any uh, direct complaints of late about that facility? I have not beyond what you've seen. Um, but I do know that there are uh, periodic reports on our platform of odor detection. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it continues to be a work in progress, but I think that the, I think anecdotally, I've heard many of the odor concerns that were brought forward through our initial licensing phase. Uh, I, I don't see or hear anything of that frequency and I've heard many reports that things are improving. Okay. Um, so that's what I would offer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Moving on to old business, order number 22-024, the second reading and the new request for a marijuana license from Main Lab LLC, located at 71 Pleasant Hill Road for an adult, an adult marijuana products manufacturing facility. And Liam, would you like to introduce this one? Sure, this is a uh, second reading, final approval on this license. Again, this is uh, previously a, a licensed establishment uh, as a medical manufacturer. Uh, They're proposing, proposing to move into adult uh, product manufacturing. So not a, not a change in the operation, just a different license uh, from the medical market to the adult use market. Okay. Any members of the public like to speak to this item? 
Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. Quite just a question. Can you confirm what uh, zone this is in? I, I believe uh, Pleasant Hill is light industrial or industrial or just industrial. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion? Okay. All those in favor? It's unanimous. Moving on to new business, order number 22-034, first reading and refer to the planning board, the proposed amendments to chapter 405, town of Scarborough zoning ordinance, section six definitions. And this is coming to us from the planning's, uh, planning and code staff. And it looks like Jay is ready to introduce it. Yes, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair. Happy to uh, be here tonight. Uh, this item is actually coming to you really by way of our Zoning Board of Appeals and then through subsequently through our Ordinance Committee. Over the years, uh, one of the appeals that the uh, uh, Board of Appeals frequently has to deal with is nonconformities on lots that have multiple street frontages, corner lots, if you will. Um, and the difficulty is that the way our ordinance currently reads is each one of those yards is considered a front yard. And typically in each of our zones, a front yard setback is much greater than a side yard setback. And it's really caused, particularly in some of the tighter neighborhoods, if you think of Pine Point or Higgins Beach, it's really caused um, some complexities for property owners. So um, with that, the Board of Appeals asked staff to work with the ordinance committee to bring something forward that might seek to uh, address the, the issues. So really seeking to develop sensible provisions that would allow property owners to have more um, predictability in terms of what they can do with their property, as well as sort of, um, yeah, just provide for a more efficient process and use of property. So that is what the proposal before you is. I will state um, it's interesting in our definitions, we have a definition of corner lots under the C's, ABC, uh, and then under uh, definitions, we have yards, yard front, yard side. So what we've done is we struck corner lots from being under corner lots and put it under front yard. Um, so, all, so when someone's trying to understand what their setbacks are, they're going to one spot in the definitions rather than having to bounce around. So that's some of the strike through that you're seeing. And a bunch of the underline in the new language is really about how you deal with the secondary frontage being treated as a side yard rather than a front yard. Thank you. Any questions for Jay? You only have one front, or now you can. One front, well, yeah, yes, one front. <laughs> <laughs> Any members of the public like to speak to this item? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. Yeah, I'd just like to say, uh, uh, Brian Longstaff and Jay joined us in the Ordinance Committee and did a very thorough job you know, explaining uh, to us the benefits of this. So it's, you know, we appreciate that work. We know that's, uh, you know, one of those things that just, it takes a lot of time to do. But also it's nice that we now will have official definitions of front and side yards and we'll no longer have to rely on where the blue tarp is over a wood pile to, <laughs> to, to pertain to the second yard. Thank you, sir. Any other discussion? Um, so this will go to the planning board next and then I believe we'll come back to us for a uh, second reading at a future day. Uh, with that, all in favor? And it is unanimous. Uh, next is order number 22-035, first reading and scheduled public hearing on the proposed fiscal 2023 municipal and school budget. Tom. Yes, this is the first step in your adoption process, the chart. The town charter very clearly indicates uh, the, the budget order is uh, essentially treated as as uh, as you do an ordinance. So it has first reading, public hearing, and, and second reading. I would note uh, historically we would do the presentation and first reading on the same night. And I think perhaps wisely a past council uh, not too many years ago said you know we're seeing it for the first time. I'm not really comfortable taking action tonight. And so consequently we've tried to separate those two only by a week just the same. Uh, and then there are very deliberate process uh, steps throughout the adoption process, a separate public hearing, 
separated um, by a good amount of time for the uh, ultimate second reading and, and adoption. So this really starts the process uh, and it's the council's process through its finance committee to kind of work through over the next six or seven weeks. Uh, and as I said at the presentation, staff stands ready to support you in that review and, and uh, deliberation. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Tom? Any members of the public like to speak to this item? Okay, seeing none, uh, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And discussion? Councilor Katarina. Yeah, having been on the council since 2013, when we had really big budgets come before us, I was very pleased to see um, what's come forward on both the municipal and school side. So I wanna thank everyone for their upfront work. And uh, I look forward to, you know, the work, further work on the fund finance committee on this, but I think it's a great start, so. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Anderson. Yep, I'm looking forward to, to digging in on the finance committee to, to look into the budget more. Um, one thing I did wanna share with the public is that in addition to all of the other opportunities you have to, to engage on this by emailing us or attending our finance committee meetings, we are gonna be doing budget roundtables again, which is something that we did pre-COVID. Um, those dates will probably get published soon for the public to be able to participate. We're gonna do four of them at different times and locations to try and accommodate people as best we can. So looking forward to doing those as well and just having another opportunity for people to share feedback. Council Sander. Uh, sure, I would like to just um, highlight that it means that the council maintains the goal um, for the 2022, for, as part of our 2022 goals for the fiscal year 23 budget, to still come in at that 3% or less mill rate goal. Um, and so we recognize that this is first reading and that there are lots of things in motion and that both finance committees have work to do between now and second reading. Um, but that, you know, as, as far as that still being one of our council goals, um, that, you know, we're, we're still on target to, to get that. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. And thank you, Tom and, mm -hmm. and the school department. I, I concur that, you know, our starting point is better than it's been in a lot of years. Uh, I, I've really been uh, interested in the form of the budget order. Uh, it, we go through a very detailed budget with thousands of line items, but the, what we actually pass is pretty straightforward and it's in, in the packet tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, at the department level, we establish how much you can spend. And then we also establish how much we're gonna collect from the taxpayer. And everything else, um, you know, kind of is outside of our purview. Um, so if you get some time, I'd, I'd encourage you to, to kind of read it and take it in and, and keep it in mind when, uh, you know, as we work through the processes, this is what we're trying to establish really is how much we, how much spending we want to allow and how much we can afford to um, ask the tax, taxpayer for. Um, with that, all those in favor of approving the budget order. Councillor Hamill, yes. we're calling a roll. Nope. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yes. like, now you know why I like the roll call. I know you do, <laughs> but we had coffee this morning, so um, it's unanimous. Thank you, and thank you guys for coming. A reminder. Uh, Twenty hours ago. Next is order number twenty-two zero three six. Act on the request pursuant to Title Twenty-Three MRSA three thousand twenty-five and the requirements of section four of the Scarborough Street Acceptance Ordinance to approve the streets as noted and recommended by the town engineer. Tom, do you wanna cue this up? The ah. town engineer has, uh, has waited it out. I suppose we ought to give it a chance to introduce this to you. Thank you. Sure. Um, so this is just for a request for street acceptance. This is um, a pretty basic process that we go through um, Basically, developers, I deal with, uh, work with developers, contractors, and our inspectors on the site and make sure that um, they're meeting our standard as they go through the construction process. So there's a lot of checks and balances that happen before um, this ends up in front of you. And Layton Farm is obviously one of our larger subdivisions, and this is the third piece. So I've already been in front of you with phase one, phase two. This is phase three. 
um, Dillon Drive, and it's a piece of Dillon Drive. So you'll see me two more times for Layton Farm. But um, so with that, we put everything together in a packet and um, believe this meets the standard. I, I guess the other thing I wanted to point out is past councils have asked me in my memo to note as we kind of tick along, um, we're adding lane miles with each of these street acceptance. So I track that, um, which the finance department loves. We do the our annual auditing. I track all of that. Um, so it's an asset, things like that. Um, and it also keeps us on top of how many lane miles we actually have accepted over the years. So it's some information for you to, to look at periodically. It, just as an aside, uh, an applicant will present to the planning board their intentions in this case of building and, and um, ultimately dedicating streets to be public. That then requires them to build them to a certain level. And uh, the planning board has kind of an initial role, but more importantly, it's staff to ensure that as they build, they're actually meeting all of the very, very detailed standards in terms of road base and width and so on and so forth. Yeah. And so we are to the point where they've met all those requirements and they will now become public streets. Thank you. Any members of the public like to speak to this item? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. Next is order number 22-037, act on the request for Mass Landing Brew Company for a mass gathering permit for the Wavy Days Brew Festival scheduled for Saturday, July 23rd, 2022, from noon to 4 p.m. And this is coming to us from the fire chief. Yeah, fire chief is here. Uh, there's really no magic. Chief Thurlow was always the one that would shepherd these mass gathering permits through the process. We have uh, the ordinance requires involvement of nearly all town staff. Uh, and so someone needs to quarterback that. And uh, Chief Kinlan has done that in this case. What I've just passed out is really no different. Uh, there, there was a slight uh, change to their submission um, and they supplied supplemental materials. Um, the fire chief uh, was recommending is still recommending approval with conditions. And really for your ease, rather than referring back to his memo, we've just put those conditions right below this so you can see them. Uh, but again, so this, this is in compliance with our mass gathering uh, ordinance and has gone through the rigors of staff review, really assuring that uh, public safety is met uh, and uh, sanitation and, and health standards, so on and so forth. Um, I, I know Chief Kinlan is available should you need his services. And these do look like they're similar conditions that he had right. included in his. Yeah, in his memo. there was one late change they had intended on in using some of the facilities in the grandstand for bathrooms in particular. Um, I think for insurance reasons, they were they ultimately are not able to, so they've made other accommodations uh, for for those support facilities. Uh, certainly, uh, with these conditions, we're comfortable with them. Okay. Any members of the public would uh, like to speak to this item? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Councilor Hamill. I had a question. So um, I don't know much about, you know, minimums for parking and that sort of thing, but it did seem to me that three and a half parking spaces, is that right, per attendee? If I'm looking at number one, the certain it requires a certain amount of space per attendee, 10 square feet minimum, as well as a parking minimum of 3.5. Is that 3.5 square feet or 3.5 parking spaces? I'm going to have to rely on Chief Kinlan. Hopefully he is tuned in and able to and respond. I'm, I'm not asking this just to see if he's listening or not. So I, I was just curious. I just, you know. I think it's a good test. Let's Chief Kinlan, are you there? <laughs> I am. Can you hear me okay? We can. <laughs> So the question, if, if you didn't hear it, was uh, item number one under the order for conditions uh, seems to call out that they were going to be required to have three and a half parking spaces per attendee. And Councilor Hamill thought that sounded excessive. Can, can you speak to that? Yeah, I believe uh, when I picked, uh, I, I actually reached out to uh, Jay um, and um, uh, when I looked at this, I think this was one of his recommendations, but I, I believe this was more so to... Uh, 
it's three and a half parking spaces per attendee because they may come in different cars or um, I think that's kind of the, the, the precipice for that being put in there. Um, I do have, I'm looking for the email as I'm talking to you just to see exactly what that explanation was. So I apologize, I wasn't prepared for that one. Thanks. Uh, too much parking doesn't sound like a problem. So, I mean, I was just, I was just curious. But, uh, they, they probably have the space for it too. Yeah, I, I appreciate uh, you're checking that sheet. Thank in, you. In the end, uh, Counselor, what we realized was that in their um, in their map of the event, it looked like there was plenty of space and plenty of room. And we also made sure they called out some emergency traffic routes so that uh, pedestrians and vehicles weren't going to be uh, an issue. Great. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so Tom just showed me a map that I, I know they're trying to get 1400 attendees to this and that map seemed to show a thousand parking spaces, uh, at the risk of this having to come back to us again. Can I motion to strike the, I, I'd like to motion to strike the 3.5 vehicles per attendee language. Um, it, it, they're going to have to be required to submit a site plan anyways, but it seems like that that would require 4,000, uh, close to 5,000 parking spaces. Yeah. Yeah, so, again, I want to be clear. That was not my intent. It was just kind of like, well, we're going to wing it, but, uh, or but I'm going to uh, suggest that we wing. I, I'll offer that as a motion to strike that from condition one, the 3.5 in parentheses per attendee. I'll second. second. Any discussion? Okay. Uh, I'll call the vote. All those in favor. And it's unanimous. So now we'll uh, go back to the order as amended. Any further discussion? Or questions? Uh, my only Councilor. request would be that moving forward, we get that language cleared up just so that if it does come back around, we understand mm -hmm. what the parking requirement is. Certainly. Very good. Um, with that, I'll call the vote on the main motion as amended. All those in favor? And it is unanimous. Thank you, Chief. Now we have order number 22-038, act on the request to direct the town clerk to refer any business license renewals that have had more than 30 calls for public safety services, public and fire or EMS between January 1, 2022 to the date of application received by the clerk's office to the town council for approval. And I'm bringing this forward. Uh, <clears throat> there's been a surge in the number of calls for service, uh, particularly uh, police calls lately. Uh, mostly related to area hotels, but I didn't want to uh, isolate area hotels in, in this. There's you know, other establishments that have had excessive calls as well. Uh, as an example, as a hotel owner in Old Orchard Beach, uh, if I have more than three calls, uh, 911 calls to my property, my business license could be up for renewal. So this is way more lenient than that, but I thought it was necessary for us to start signaling that, hey, you know what, there's a, a, a responsibility on the part of business owners to ensure that their guests are safe and that the public surrounding their establishments is, are, are also safe. Uh, and this isn't to say that the clerk wouldn't have referred them to us anyways, it's just helping to take that discretion out of the equation in, the, in these situations. Um, so th that's, that's the, the topic. Are there any members of the public that would like to speak to this? I'm seeing nobody in, in person. We do have one online. Ms. Gifta, Giftos, uh, you should be unmuted now uh, and you can go ahead. Thank you. Um, and thank you for bringing this forward. Um, I'd, I'd like to suggest that 30 calls, um, in my opinion, is um, probably more than I, at least I would like or feel comfortable with for a review by the, the council. Um, and and with this, I, I really think that the, the town should take a look at um, how it's communicating this information to uh, the citizens. I, I think that um, obviously this is a public safety issue and it's incumbent upon the town to be actively communicating the increased calls for service that's been occurring in our town. I think that that's information that needs to be shared directly from the town. Um, and so that people can take more defensive measures to protect themselves and their family if, if, if that's necessary or, or not. I mean, at this point, people are talking about it. That's not where I wanna get my information. I'd like to get it directly from the town 
um, so that I know if that's something that I need to consider um, as I make decisions for myself, my family, um, to ensure that we're we're protected. And and um, so I'd ask you to consider how you're going to communicate that um, proactive that information proactively to the town, so that they know what 30 calls mean. Does it does it mean you know 30 fire alarms pulled, or does it mean 30 drug calls, or 30 um, assaults? I, um, that's information that I think um, people really need to know. Thank you, Ms. Giftos. Thank you. Councilor Hamill, did you want to respond? Yeah, yeah I, I was just going to say that I think that I believe we, at least in the end report, I seem to recall there was a public safety report that kind of itemizes. There was some analysis in terms of types of calls. I don't think it goes to the to the extent that uh, Alicia refers to here, but I'm quite sure that we have a way of you know, way of capturing that, but I think it's a fair point that she raises about trying to find a way to do that more regularly as a sort of a proactive way to kind of keep an eye on key indicators. Um, I do know it's, it, it lags a little bit, but we do report incidents to the, the uh, national organizations. There's a uniform crime reporting system that uh, we participate in, and it does get very granular actually in terms of the type of establishment, the type of uh, incident. Um, I would like to understand a little better though, like that's lagging. Are there, do we put police reports out in, in the paper or do we still do that? We, we typically don't in terms of kind of aggregate uh, crime statistics. Uh, we certainly do provide police logs in terms of uh, summons issued and, and you know, other criminal activity. Um, and, and those, any incidents at any of these locations would be reported through those means. but. We don't have a common practice of uh, routinely reporting crime statistics, particularly at location by location. Uh, this might be something you know, worth us considering how to do that. Uh, and I think but we have to do it responsibly as well. Uh, just to the, to the speaker, uh, Mrs. Giptos, you know, the town clerk is sitting here, I'm sitting here, I assure you, and she still has the discretion to bring any license for renewal back to the council. I think uh, in this case, we will certainly um, be cautious and thoughtful and, and, uh, and bring matters. The 30 calls, I think, is, a, is actually a fairly low threshold. And I think that's going to catch and bring to the council the, the properties that you really want to be uh, have full transparency about. Okay. Any other public comment? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So I, oh, yeah, thank you. Second. <laughs> Very good. Sorry, I'm getting <laughs> the end of the day. Any discussion? Councilor Anderson. Yeah, no, I think I think this is a good measure to, to put into place. I know there's been a lot more concern and conversation out in the community about noticeable increases in, in, in crime. Specifically in my neighborhood, there was somebody who went around and you know went into our went, went into cars that were unlocked and took goods that were in there. And I think that's just such an uncommon occurrence, I think, in Scarborough for people. Yeah, I know exactly. Like, but but that's the thing, people feel safe here. And so sometimes when you feel safe, you forget to do some of those measures. Um, but it's totally understandable that, you know, people are starting to feel a little bit more worried. But to Gene Reese's point, which you might not have heard, like people should be locking their cars, like make sure you lock your cars. Um, and it's just good. The the good thing about this though is that I think. It's important for people to always be conscious about public safety because you never know and you should always just be thoughtful right about no matter what's going on around you that you know even if you feel safe anything could ever happen um, but I think this is a good measure to just kind of address some of the concerns we've heard in the public to make sure that these businesses if they're not doing their part are brought forward to the council so that we can can decide whether or not we're going to renew their license. Thank you, Councilor. Perhaps, it, it, perhaps a, a comment would give uh, Council some, hopefully comfort, but maybe at least insight. Uh, you know, with the knowledge of, of things in transition or changing, uh, frankly, no one's come and asked our opinion or permission. And so we're trying to figure this out as we go. We think we have a pretty good understanding of what's happening and have actually established really good relations with many of these operators. And I can report that we're, we're somewhat pleased with kind of how responsive they are. So time will tell whether it actually changes some behaviors. Um, 
let's face it, uh, many of these establishments are dealing with populations that have some real challenges. And um, to the extent that our resources allow and so far so good, our strategy is really to not embrace them, but to really uh, step in toward the, what's going on as opposed to sitting back and simply responding to the call when it mm -hmm. comes in. And I'm hopeful that again, within our resources, I, I, we're not gonna extend ourselves too far, but I know our social uh, service navigator is making herself available uh, on dedicated uh, um, afternoon each week at certain mm -hmm. establishments to meet with clients and, and to help um, you know get them some support services. So mm -hmm. uh, that's just one example, but I think that strategy is uh, so far being productive, just being fully aware of what's going on, making as best we can a relationship with the operators, understanding their challenges and what we can do to help support them. Mm -hmm. Tom, point of information, maybe Tom, can you talk a little bit about how um, the town has no ability to prevent any of these agencies from placing people in need right now where, wherever they're needing to place them? That's my understanding is that some of these agencies, it's it, they have emergency authority to be able to find um, shelters for people who are in need. Yeah, the, ch the challenge, what we're seeing is the use of traditional uh, hotels, uh, you know, re renting rooms nightly or maybe even slightly longer than that to members of the public. We're seeing them being used for temporary housing for all sorts of uh, reasons, uh, really meeting uh, what's portrayed as a crisis in our region in terms of, uh, you know, 1,500 folks or so in this region needing temporary housing nightly. Um, the challenge for us, and I think it's true of many communities, hotels, the definition of a hotel in our zoning ordinance is a uh, consecutive stay uh, no longer than 186 mm -hmm. days. And so you know, under that very broad definition, what's happening there is not, um, it doesn't violate any land use laws, but it certainly is different. Uh, and so we don't have any direct line into um, curbing or stopping that behavior. Frankly, the license process is your best way to uh, speak directly to the operator. And I think it's entirely within your purview to impose certain conditions on renewal of license, given uh, a change in, in use and practice. Uh, I think there's some other strategies we could look at in terms of <coughs> where the funding comes from. Uh, many of these are franchisees. So there's a corporate partner associated with, uh, with the operation in some to some extent. But I, again, as a council, as a legislative body, your direct way to influence and change behavior is through the license process. Thank you. Councilor Caterina. Yeah, and and I absolutely understand the angst with all of this. Um, and you have all heard my spiel on, you know, okay. I firmly believe that people have a right to a roof over their head at every night, if possible. Um, but my concern with it is that I think it's great that people are able to be housed in these facilities, but I'm concerned as a, as a someone who has a master's degree in social work that, you know, are they getting services or, or are they just being, I hate to use the word dumped too, because that's a horrible word to use, but are they being dumped in these facilities? Um, yeah, they're getting a roof over their head, but nothing else. Um, no assistance with food, no assistance with mental health needs, substance abuse, you know, whatever. Um, so I, I, I'm hopeful and I know that all of us, I believe on this council, you know, will be thoughtful about what we're doing with this. Um, and, and it's not that we're saying, yeah, we don't want any of those people anywhere around in this town, they don't belong here, but it's, you know, we wanna be thoughtful uh, with what we're doing in the process and making sure that we are being um, helpful and giving assistance to those who need it, but in a way that's useful, I guess, if that's the right word. So that's just, you know, my thoughts on this. Councilor Sider. And just to add to what Councilor Katarina is saying and to be upfront about it. Yeah. I think that that's really kind of what the, the public comment was speaking to is just you know, we're addressing this head on tonight. We're yep. we're looking at the appropriate channels as a legislative body. And then there's that additional request to communicate that to the public, just so that people can make informed decisions, you know, for the health and safety of, of their family. Yeah, it, a lot of times the, the issue to solving a problem is financial, right? It's funding. Oh, yeah. And uh, we're in kind of an interesting situation where the funding is there 
to help solve the problem of homelessness, homelessness or being dis, dislocated. Um, what isn't there is the expertise and the support. So we're, we have a role to play. And I think Scarborough up to this point is responding in true Scarborough fashion where the staff is trying to um, make a dent in it, right? And so they're putting staff on site to uh, provide services. We have limited resources. And where this comes in is I think the, the, the businesses that are profiting off of this, right? Good for you, you're, you're, you're making money, but you have a responsibility to make sure that the, the guests in your establishment and those that live near it are, um, are safe. And, and that's where I think we can come in and do our part. And, and maybe, maybe we'll wind up in a better place at the end of this is, is my hope. Uh, not looking to put anybody out of business, but uh, everybody should feel safe in the community that they live in. I think that's one of our um, primary responsibilities. Uh, and, and that includes people who are homeless being yes. safe, you yes. know, because that's a terribly unsafe community at times, so. And just to put a timeline to this, uh, all the lodging licenses are on an annual renewal, which will occur in May. So you'll be seeing these come uh, sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we'll continue to uh, monitor what's going on, compile statistics, and we can talk about how to share that information out. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? It's unanimous. And Finally, uh, order number 22-039 is act on the request to direct the Housing Alliance to advise on factors to consider in allowing lodging establishments to convert to affordable or workforce housing. Um, this is a parallel action with the, the previous one. Um, and uh, we've talked about it before. We've had somebody come forward uh, requesting uh, a conversion uh, and we've seen you know, how the properties are used elsewhere. You know, if we don't allow it. Uh, so this isn't an action to allow it. This is an action to let's learn more about it. And I think we've got some resources uh, in, on the Housing Alliance that can help us understand the dynamic better and possibly some conditions that we might put on any type of conversion or, or maybe they'll advise that we don't do it. Uh, I'm just, uh, this is just an action item saying, <clears throat> please advise, please, please help us. And uh, Councilor Katarina as liaison to the Housing Alliance, I think we'll bring this to them and, and get some, uh, some expert feedback. Uh, so that's the, th that's the intent, that's the motion. Uh, any members of the public like to speak to this? Seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. And discussion. Councilor Anderson. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I think this is a good idea to, to have them explore and um, just building off of the workshop we had today where we heard from the experts on the sustainability committee. I really like bringing in the committees to hear some ideas from them as residents and especially informed residents to help us solve some of these challenges. You know, I'm interested in hearing their opinions related to the topic at hand, but just in general, the affordable housing challenges we have as a community, what other ideas are they thinking, are they talking about that could even incite some ideas for us that we might wanna further explore. So I'm excited to, to see what they come up with and I'm excited to see Hopefully this turns into a workshop opportunity in the future where we can hear from them and also right. hear some other ideas like we just did with sustainability. Excellent. Councilor Katarina. I was gonna ask on this and I just have to think of it sitting here. Do we wanna have a report back time on this? Report back by September 15th or? Not that I want people to work over the summer. I, I'm gonna say as soon as possible, but I don't- Yeah, but I, uh, yeah. Um, because it, I just think that when you say, I, this is me, yeah. you know, when you give someone a homework assignment, like you guys are supposed to get back your stuff on charter, which is in. So how about this? Uh, <laughs> uh, that, that it's helpful to have, have a date, you know, to have it back by. That's, uh, I'm just saying, if, I, do you want to put it in here or not? I don't care. I, I want your and the committee's opinion about how much time you need. So why don't why don't we when, meet and when we'll you bring report a, this back. to them? Yeah, and uh, okay. and then you know that mechanism might be scheduling a okay. workshop. Cool. All right. Okay. Any other discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Uh, next is non action items. We have none. Uh, standing and special committee reports and liaison reports. Councilor Anderson. Yep, so we had our communications committee 
this past Monday and we talked about budget roundtables. It was a joint committee meeting with the school board. Um, we will be publishing those dates for those roundtables. Again, it's a similar format where there will be 90 minute sessions where the public can come ask questions. We may not be able to answer everything in those forums. It's really about getting feedback. We'll take those questions, hopefully add them into the FAQ document that we're creating for the budget overall. So that way it'll be a source for people to reference for, for any questions that they have. So we're excited to do that again. Um, we're gonna look for at least one counselor to attend each of these. I think Ken Johnson, myself and um, Counselor Scyther are committed to attending at least one. At least one. So if it were, when they're scheduled, if whatever works for, for the rest of the council, if you guys would like to attend, I sent an email just asking for your availability. So if you could just confirm so we can make sure we have, have at least one counselor in attendance, that would be great. Um, we had our counselor corner live last week. The topic was on growth. Um, it was a really great turnout. And again, I think this format of, of trying to engage the public in a slightly different manner is something we wanna, the communication committee recommends we continue. I think going forward, what we'll do is we'll bring the topic as an agenda item prior to scheduling, just to make sure the council has the opportunity to align on the topic. Um, we'll be discussing topics in the next communication committee, com communications committee meeting in May. And there's some ideas already floating around around environmental sustainability, um, just public engagement in general. We talked about potentially workforce, our affordable housing as a potential topic. So these are just ideas floating around. So if there's anything in particular that a counselor would like to do and, and host, you know, feel free to let us know so that we can talk about it at the next communications committee. And we're hoping to try and do the next one end of June is kind of what we targeted. So again, that's up for, for discussion if and depends on availability, but that's really where we wanna go. Um, for the school building committee, we've been meeting with them. Uh, Again, in terms of getting a tour scheduled for the council, um, I went back and forth with Todd Jepson and just at this point suggested maybe we target doing a tour after the budget second read. Um, so I told him to go ahead and just offer some dates after May 18th that we'll just pick that date and whoever's available um, for a tour of the three prim primary schools and probably the middle school. Um, we would kind of do, figure out the time and, and do that. Um, the, the school committee, is still looking for volunteers, I believe, to support the committee itself. So I think we've tried to push stuff out through um, the e-news. I know the school has pushed out, pushed out information for how people can sign up. So again, if you're, if you're looking to volunteer and have something to do, they're in need of, of participants. Um, and then last, the, the library. This week is National Library Week. National Library Week. I can't talk today. I don't know why. <laughs> I'm tired. Yeah. So it's the 60th anniversary. Uh, it started in 1958. Um, the, the theme this year is libraries lead. So it's really cool because the library is asking everybody to fill out a sticker that talks about, you know, when, where, or where has the library led you in your life? So how has the experience you've had at the library led you to do something different? So it'll be interesting to see um, what comes out in that wall. And I, I anticipate Nancy bringing that to our budget conversation <laughs> just to show us all the things that people say about great things about the library. Um, they had held their open house this past weekend and had about 75 people show up to do the tours. If you weren't able to go, uh, you can get a virtual, to virtual tour online. On, uh, if you go to expansion.scarboroughlibrary.com or .org, um, they'll have a video there where you can actually see some of the behind the scenes parts of the library that you don't see when you typically show up. So encourage people to go and, and look at that. Thank you. Yeah. Councilor Sider. Uh, as has been mentioned over and over and over again, Finance Committee is uh, getting ready and, and gearing up now towards the next six weeks of in-depth budget conversations. We had our table setting meeting last night uh, just to discuss the, the overall flow and calendar. There are gonna be some changes to the calendar that was published in the original budget book, um, just based on availability and the need to move some departments around. Thank you to the school department for being so flexible. Um, and so the revised calendar will be ready um, by the end of the week. I think Presumably. it's already up. Okay, and, and perfect. It, it will be highlighted in the e-newsletter tomorrow. Well. Perfect. Yep. Um, and so that's an excellent resource in terms of 
how to access us. Thank you very much. Um, as you can see, it is a full and busy calendar. There's lots of opportunities for engagement, but each of those um, three hour sessions starting the 19th um, through May 3rd, no, May 10th, um, are really gonna be when the finance committee digs deep into our department budgets. Um, we'll have our department heads there to answer questions. We are gonna create an FAQ document, um, which is gonna be a shared Google document for um, council questions. So if you have a question, we, we set a tentative ask that questions um, be submitted about a week before that we meet with the department if possible. Um, that will give the, the department some time to gather any relevant information in order to give us the best answer to that question. That being said, it's a fluid document and we all understand that you know, questions will come up in real time and we'll, get, we'll do our best to get that information updated um, as it comes to us. So keep an eye out for that um, Google Doc. Uh, and we also have plans to share the FAQ with the school department. Uh, as John highlighted, we are going to uh, do a return to the budget roundtables. And so we have, Liam has graciously set up a calendar for us to add those to our schedule, uh, just to increase engagement with the public. Um, but we had a discussion about the timing of those in terms of whether they were relevant closer to second read or whether they were would be more valuable um, early on in the budget process. And we all said, you know, people want those for different reasons. Sometimes it's to ask department level questions um, and make sure that, they're, that their questions get asked when we have those department level meetings. And sometimes they're just kind of overall general clarification questions. Um, so hopefully those will be informative and um, just another opportunity for people to make sure that they feel like as we move through this budget development process that they have the opportunity to, to be engaged. And informed. And I look forward to getting started with all of that when I get back from my trip. <laughs> Sounds like you're ready. <laughs> Any other uh, special committee or liaison reports? Councilor Hamill. I was just going to mention that uh, next week, uh, Monday, we'll be having an appointments uh, committee meeting at 5 30. And then on Tuesday, we'll have back-to-back uh, -back meetings of uh, coastal waters and shellfish. And I was just gonna mention that uh, resident and non-resident commercial shellfish lotteries are, are taking place uh, tomorrow, I guess, right? Tomorrow and Friday. Applications are taken today and tomorrow and the lottery, the lottery will be on Friday afternoon. Right. And then I think the following week is for non-resident. Non resident recreational shellfish and over 65 complementary shellfish lotteries. Mm -hmm. So, thanks. And you got your ticket, right? <laughs> I got it. I don't know if I'm going to turn it in or not, but I'm <laughs> halfway there. Good luck. Um, a, a couple of things. Uh, one, we have some candidates. Uh, so we are going to have an election in June, and it's going to be a contestant election. Uh, uh, Mr. Peter Freilinger. Uh, has turned in his nomination papers, as has uh, Mr. Nick McGee and Mr. Martin Topol. Um, so those will be our three candidates. And Tony? If I could, um, I've been in communication with the chamber, and they are going to be sponsoring a candidate's night April 27th um, at 7 p.m. here in chambers. I'm marking the date. Okay. So this will be exciting. Um, and... Secondly, I, we have a regularly scheduled meeting on April 20th that I am uh, going to be canceling short of an emergency. Uh, it will allow us to focus on budget and I will be traveling for that meeting. So if there's an emergency item that comes up, Councilor Johnson will, uh, I'll call the meeting and he'll, he'll be able to run it. But um, we, you can plan for that, that meeting to be canceled. And that's all I have right now. Uh, next is council member comments. Does anybody have any comments? We're worn out. <laughs> With that, Tony, would you call the roll to adjourn just to mix things up a little? You need a motion. So moved. Second. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Sider. Yes. Councilor Anderson. Yes. Councilor Katarina. Yes. Councilor Hamill. Yes. And Chairman Colucci. Yes. Unanimous. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>